The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are our own or those of our guests, and in no way represent the views of the companies, associations, or organizations that any of us may work for or represent. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they were told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Eye Dent. You're listening to Squawk Eye Dent, an aviation podcast that explores the many pathways to an aviation profession. The challenges that a professional aviator can expect in today's marketplace, and we share many stories along the way. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, a professional airline pilot currently flying for a U.S. legacy airline with close to 20 years on the flight line. Welcome aboard Flight 125 of the Squawk Ident End podcast, recorded on the 8th of January, 2023, from the Mobile Aviator Sound Studios from somewhere in Temecula, California. On today's flight, we are celebrating the first flight of Season 5 of the Squawk Eyed In podcast. Alex and I recently had the honor in sitting down with a truly remarkable aviator whose journey in aviation started in the early 1970s. That is when his decorated military pilot father paid the steep cost of $600 for him to achieve his private pilot certificate in just under two months. With the passion for aviation within him, he went on to become an aircraft washer, a line fueler, a gold seal flight instructor, a dispatcher, a 727 flight engineer, corporate pilot, and an airline pilot as well. From Apaches, Turbo Commanders, to Twin Otters, DC-10, Super 80s, 7576s, and 737s, his remarkable journey building upon an aviation career has seen many, many challenges. In 2013, at the age of 65 years young, he retired from American Airlines. I was honored to be invited into his home, where he and his son, a third-generation pilot, sat down with me to tell his story. This is the interview with retired American Airlines captain, Greg Daigle, and his son, Alex. First off, let's start off by saying thank you so much for joining us today. It is an honor. You're welcome. Yeah. So Alex has been a part of Squawk Ident now for how long? Um, I started listening probably about a year and a half-ish ago and wrote in, and that was just about the time that I was starting to interview. So probably about a year on the show now. About a year. And, you know, we've been talking back and forth about your, your journey in aviation. And a lot of that uh, had to come down to your roots and how you got started. Um, There are so many different pathways to a career in aviation. And what we focus on here at Squawk Ident is the journey of today's aviator and how different that can be. You were very, very, very fortunate to be the rug rat out on the ramp at LAX. You've told us so many stories about how you used to go see your dad off at work. Yep. And today we have the honor of interviewing retired Captain Greg Diggle. And Captain, welcome. Yep. Thank you. So what we wanted to talk about is your journey. And most people have a story about, well, when I was a young kid, you know, I, I looked up and saw airplanes and I just thought that's for me. What was your journey like? How did your spark start out? Well, it wasn't like that. I grew up in Hawaii. And uh, I went into the Coast Guard at 17 because I had no direction in my parents. I didn't want to stay at my parents. And <clears throat> so I went in there. Uh, I, it taught me a lot in the fact that I saw what lifers were and I didn't want to be a lifer. And so that gave me the reason to go to college. So I went. But I hadn't done that well in high school. (laughs) So I had to take remedial stuff, of which I got out of a lot of them, because I actually had some brain power, I guess, and and it gave me things, and and I went up. And uh, and then I got, I was going to be a math major, and I got uh, talked into, I had a mentor, a guy named Dave Johnson that was, at the flight school that I that I came up in, I I learned to fly there. 
I worked my way up. I was lucky because I never, never asked anybody if I could be a flight instructor. I just put my name on the list, and then it started working from there. No, oh, I wow. never got interviewed, nothing. I just put my name on the list, and I became a flight instructor. And this was in Hawaii? No, this was here. Oh, here in yeah. uh, well, California. I should say, I did uh, the Coast Guard, but I, was, but I was based in Long Beach. Oh, okay. I did, uh, you know, not that it makes it matter, but I did two tours, um, six-month tours down to the Antarctica. And uh, so I was there, and I got out in San Diego, and I decided to stay. I'd met my wife, and uh, we were, obviously, we weren't married at the time. And uh, anyway, I stayed here basically for her, and I went to college, and it was a lot cheaper here at that time. And uh, I became a math major. That's what I wanted to do. But then I got talked into by this mentor guy that being an engineer would be the way to go. So I changed to, it was electrical engineering, but with a computer option. Now, mind you, this is before any of the apples came out. There, yeah. was, no, there was no laptops. There was nothing. Yeah. I had to learn to write programs that were machine language and do all that punch cards punch cards yeah yeah punch cards turn them in wait for the next day and then uh and um i lost interest because i was never uh you remember all those guys that used to get their they bought the radio maker kit that was you know when they oh, were yeah. six and everything and that i yeah. never did that i never had that and uh, I went through this, and I was I was doing well. And then about my uh, junior year, about halfway through, I decided to quit because mm. it just wasn't for me. I wasn't in the heart. I love the math. Yeah, I did every kind of math uh, you could, but uh, that was it. And uh, so I quit college, and I was instructing. And I started full-time instructing. Totally, I did it, I believe, it was seven years, which is a long time. And uh, Well, going back to the initial of getting your license. Yeah. So I got my license. I got my commercial, got my instrument, got my uh, instructor, and uh, just started working and doing it that way. How did you... How did you get your, um, what did you use to fund it? Like, wh what was the process of all that getting, because I know you said your dad paid for your private. My private. He paid for my private, and then it was uh, $500. And, and so you were, you were taking flight instruction back at a time when, I mean, now uh, I always get just, so excited when I hear how much flight instruction costs. Yeah. You know, we're, we're talking 20, 30, maybe even 40, 50 years ago. And I, I spoke with one captain ages ago and said, oh, yeah, I was paying six bucks for the instructor and $10 for the airplane. I'm like, wait, what? That's can't exactly even get a, a coffee for I was that. paying $6 for the instructor. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Would buy, the airplanes would be like, $25. I don't have the exact memory, but we had a old straight tail Cessna, uh, 150. Mm -hmm. And it was a straight tail. We had others, but, uh, that one was like $20. Wow. I used what? to, I used to, <laughs> rent, it. I used yeah. to rent it and go out to El Centro. Um, and uh, my brother was a Navy pilot. And he f would fly in there, and I'd go pick him up, and it was like 20 bucks an hour, and it took a two, three hours to get there. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, you, can, you can't even touch an airplane now for, I yeah. think, under 130. But I, w I was fortunate in the sense, compared to Alex, um, I had a fl a, just a gaggle of airplanes that were like about 20 or 21. That I could go fly. I had to get checked out in certain ones, but sure. um, I could fly from a Belanca uh, a 301, I think it was, 
but it was a really fast and really good, and it was balsa wood and everything. Oh, wow. I did that. I flew Satabrias. I flew, you know, 150s. I flew 172s. Movies. In fact, my first instructor, now, you got to mind this, is when I got my... Um, um, Your instructor? Yeah, my instructor, I was automatically grand- grandfathered into a multi-engine instructor. Oh, it was back in the day. <laughs> was it not an add-on at the time? Or? No, it was just, it went, I was an instructor single engine, and I was an instructor multi-engine, because I had a multi-engine. Okay. I think the way that the instructors were written back then was it was airplane instructor, not single engine instructor. Or oh, so there was no classification yeah. at the time. It was, once so, you got your instructor in an airplane, you were a airplane yeah. instructor. I got so you. that could be for single or multi, if, if you held the appropriate license. So whatever license you held, be it, single engine, private, commercial, multi, instrument, multi, regardless of what rating you had, as long as you had the rating, once you got the instructor add-on, what if I understand this correctly, you were an instructor on everything you held a license for. Yes. Uh, yeah. Except uh, instruct, in, uh, instrument. Except instrument. You had to do that, the CFII. Oh, okay. Okay. Which that uh, That's standard across the board. That's still... Yeah, it's still the it? same, but it yeah. was that way then, yeah. too. Yeah, but... Uh, my, but that means what happened was my first instructor ride was in a multi-engine. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you, you had to demonstrate all of it, the VMC demos and all that stuff too? Um, no, not on the check not ride. Then? Oh, no, wow. I just got, I got the multi-engine instructor. Oh, that's it. That's yeah, it. I was it. His, his first, what he's saying is his first instructor like that he got hired out for yeah. was in a multi-engine That's like it. yeah like yeah. hey I, I need you to be my instructor let's go do this yeah yeah it was basically a checkout that i oh, checked I the guy out but it's still i it was an instructor your first you know, dual given was that was multi the, multi yeah. nice oh, and that's the first log book i signed nice. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway uh i did that for about Seven years, six, seven years. I don't remember the exact n- number, but uh, well, before you started as an instructor, when you were going to school at Peninsula Aviation, which is in was in Torrance, mind you, if you go to the Torrance Airfield now, it's all Robinson. Robinson was like the tiny little sliver of a corner uh, in uh, the far other side, and Torrance was not Robinson based. Um, but he started as a uh, he started as a plane washer working while going to school oh. and um then i did fuel a fueler and uh and then oh then then i then i talked him into putting me into the uh, front desk yeah front desk and i did paperwork you know the the log books not log books but but paperwork yeah the and billing. uh then i was working on my instructor and i got it and that's when I got my instructor, and I, since I was at the desk, there was a there was a column there, and I put my name on it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you remember the old school days where yeah. you had the giant the book? ledger, yeah, yeah the and, ledger where one side was instructors, one side was planes. He just went and bottom of the instructor list went, "Greg, take there it yeah. is," and That's that was exactly it. what I did. And, <laughs> You're uh, hired. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but I still worked the desk. But as people would schedule with me, I would start flying with them, and then pretty soon I quit the. Uh, desk and I uh, started doing instructing completely. Full time. And how old were you at this time? Uh, probably 23. Okay. Yeah. Uh, see, I got my license when I was 21 after, after Coast Guard. Yeah. And uh, yeah. fortunately, my father paid for it. And it was, but it was cheap then. It was, well, in, Today's dollars, it was cheap. It's, yeah, it was probably expensive then, but it was it was five hundred dollars. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what did it cost you? Oh, God, yeah. six thousand. Yeah, six thousand for your private. For my private. Yeah. 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 And like, when did you do your private? Two thousand five. Okay, and I, I did, did mine in, uh, in two thousand and one. And what was yours? Uh, out the door at forty two hours total time when I passed my check ride. I think I paid about. Thirteen hundred dollars. Okay, you um, won't believe this, but um, I did take to it pretty naturally. It, it came good. 
this is the funny is after we went through my log books, uh, it turned out I had 30, I think it was 35 hours to get a license. I only had 34 and a half. Ah, well, the check ride counts. Yeah, yeah. No, the check ride counts. The check ride counts. <laughs> <laughs> but mind you, this was different back in the day when people were still doing all the paper stuff and you didn't have the IACRA to, to, right. to, because with you go with the IACRA and you're at 34 and a half hours, the IACRA's like, nope, you need 35. Yeah. yeah. So we live in so a. So the what? So there's a. What's, the, I know, what's the IACRA? IACRA? Yeah. So IACRA is the integrated airman. It, it's the oh, FAA oh, website that we all use to. to everything's it, online yeah. and, and the, checks and balances yeah. now. And so yeah. you, you don't have confuse to, me. Um, <laughs> you, you have to put in your time, yeah. like put in the, the hour amounts in yeah. there, and it basically gives you, like, okay, you meet all the requirements. You can pass on to your so, check ride. It's no longer the days where it's like, okay, you got 34 and a half and your check ride was an hour. Cool. You meet the minimums of 35 hours. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, it just, everything came fairly simple to me. I, I don't, I'm not saying I was a, a charm at doing flying, but it all came simple. Yeah. And, uh, I got it all pretty quick. And, uh, well, you have that mathematical engineering brain, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very technical job, even though I think aviation is a, is a fine balance between hand eye coordination. It's more of an artistic feel of flying by the seat of your pants. But at the same time, in order to not kill yourself, you have to have that analytical technical yeah. brain to understand aerodynamics, understand systems. And, and so when you have a good balance of both, I, I honestly feel the same way that when I took to it, it was something I always wanted to do myself. And my instructor said, Hey, you're a natural at this. And yeah. it wasn't because I was, you know, was born with a, you know, some kind of ability that other people don't have. I just, it, it was something that just kind of made sense. It just kind of clicked together. And it sounds like your story and your journey, it started out the same way that it just kind of oh. clicked mm -hmm. for you. I remember, I don't remember this is kind of a side note, but I think it was eight, eight hours and I was doing my solo, the, yeah. the first one. Wow. And uh, everybody kind of knows my personality. And so as my instructor let me off and he stepped out of the airplane and I could go in my first supervised solos, I was singing in the airplane. Uh, Those <laughs> magnificent, <laughs> magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going around, I was having fun. It was just yeah. fun. So, it was good. But it all went, it all went pretty easy for me and I got through it. Um, I worked in a company that would allow me to um, run the bills up as I was flying. And then you know, they, they come and want me to pay it uh, yeah yeah but uh th they were actually a pretty good uh people that treated me well yeah it was i didn't think it was at the time but it was similar to your um what was it the t's the tims the the, the, the t uh, yeah tom the toms yeah uh, t1 and t2 yeah, yeah. <laughs> where it was like that where it was still a family-owned school and they yeah. were um they treated him good treated all their employees good yeah that mm -hmm. you know he like he's saying he was able to stack bills basically and then they come and say hey yeah. we need you to put down a little bit of and that's and, and often people ask me you know i have my son my daughter my cousin my nephew you know or, or themselves i say you know what flight school should i go to i really am interested in this and lately even at mainline at legacy uh we have a lot of flight attendants that are seeing all these bonuses that are being thrown around hundreds of thousands of dollars and they think well, i already work for the company right, we should just do this and they ask you know what flight school should i go to um, we, we actually spoke, I think, on the last podcast about a uh, frontier flight attendant that had called me and um, wanted a little bit of advice. Um, my advice is always get your private at a mom and pop Cessna King School program where you can pay as you go. It's a family run mm -hmm. place. Get your feet wet. See if it's really for you before you go to a flight farm mm -hmm. like ATP or some of these other mm -hmm. flight farms where you're giving them, you're signing your name on the dotted line and you're giving them a hundred thousand, if not more of a loan that you're signing for. And if you don't finish, I mean, you're still responsible. So it's nice to start out like that. And yeah. those days of the mom and pop where they'd go, yeah, you know, I know you're good for it. I know where you live. <laughs> you know, And that's kind of what these people were. They were a family. It was a, 
the the guy who owned the place was an engineer for Howard Hughes. Oh wow. He designed the he was one of the designers of the five hundred, the we called it a, a, the loach. Oh, the the MD the 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 little bird, the the one that they use in special operations. Um oh god I'm blanking on what it is. But it's a jet engine and everything in that. The M D five hundred. That's what it is. And so. he, he was the designer on that and he worked it and he used to tell me Howard Hughes stories. And um, <laughs> you know I mean Howard would do something and then you wouldn't see him for three months. Yeah. And everybody'd be sitting there waiting to sit, waiting and then he'd come back and they'd go and he'd say, Do this, do that and that. Yeah. But so it was good stories. The old, the woman was just a office worker and she was nice and everything, but uh, that one. Yeah. But uh anyway. And and you instructed for about seven years and earned a gold seal instructor. And gold seal instructor. And tell us about that. How so I remember from back in the day you had to have like what, seven passes on the first go or something within uh, a year? Eight. Eight. Eight within yeah. when, within two years you had to have with have eight. Have your CFI and um, your advanced ground instructor. So you had to have all three. So of those you had things. to have AGI, AGI instructor, uh-huh. and send eight. Eight out of ten had to pass their first guy. Oh, eighty percent pass. Eighty percent pass rate. Okay. So it, uh, I don't remember any of that. I just remember <laughs> I, whatever it was. I yeah. earned it and yeah. I got it. And th- basically, the, the only things that all this was was resume builders. Of course. Things to put on your resume and yeah. make it look better. Yeah. In fact, this is a, a one time when I was applying to airlines, all the airlines uh, employment offices were all around LA. Oh. American was, uh, uh, Western, United, TWA. I used to go to uh, TWA in the... It was back in the World Way West, and I would go into their the chief pilot's office every every Monday at eight o'clock, and I'd sit through the briefing, the the system briefing where they all talked about everything and that and that. So yeah, so from from flight instructing to corporate flying. Well, first I went to Golden West. I went up to Toronto and had uh, took a ground school on the twin otter mm. oh wow yeah i got to see the dice seven built and all that and everything but um uh, so when i went from there i had my wife uh come and meet me in new orleans and after that we went down and i went to uh metro air metro was a twin otter uh c- company and it was based in Clear Lake, which is south of Houston. And I went to there, and the, I had called the chief pilot about a week before, and he says, yeah, come down and see me. So I get down there, and I, the secretary goes, oh, he won't be able to see you today. And I said, well, I made my way all the way from California. I went through the route and everything, and I said, uh, well, I'm going to sit here until he sees me. And I sat there for a couple hours, and he saw me. Oh, good. And I got hired. Yeah. Metro is one of the airlines that merged in with Eagle. With Eagle, yeah. 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 I didn't remember that. Yeah. No, Metro. Yeah, Wings there, West. Wings West. Nash- Met, uh, Nashville. Nashville. Um, there was the North Carolina one. Executive. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Metro. Yeah. All became what is now American Eagle. And yeah, what yeah. was the one in California? Was uh, I should know all Wings this. Wings West. Yeah. You should. Yeah, Wings West, I guess. Yeah, Wings West. You should. They don't. They didn't really push. It was that seven. On us. It was the seven that created the first regional airline and ever created. Yeah. They're yeah. buying up commuter airlines. Yep. And, it's all yeah. at at the Sandpiper Academy. It's all downstairs. They have a huge like. This is what it is, and like shows all the history of became this became this, and you can see where they ended and merged into Sandpiper and continued on. Mm-hmm. So 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 I went so I went there, got the interview, came home. And he hired me. But it wasn't going to start for like a month or something like that. In the meantime, I got an interview with Golden West. Okay. Out here in L.A. And then I got hired a week before Metro Airlines. 
So what I did was, because, you know, all these, uh, I call them fly-by-nights that could be there. They're, they're an airline here, an airline there, an airline there. Yeah. I said, I'm going to go to uh, Golden West for the first week, and if I don't like it, I'll go to Metro. Oh, okay. And I liked it. Yeah. And so I called Metro, and they said, I'm not coming. And the biggest thing is you didn't have to move to Texas. No, well, that's the one thing. I've yeah. had five aviation jobs in my life. And I've never had to move or never had to commute. I've flown out of L.A. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's the blessed child of aviation well, that never had to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I heard this on, uh, I heard this on uh, America's Got Talent, and it was uh, Simon Cowell. And there was a girl, and she was a really impressive singer. And, it, and that, but one thing he said was, you know, Timing in life is everything. If you're there at the right time, it'll happen. Yeah. And just so Biden isn't a career, a storied career, but it's, I never had to move out of LA. Yeah. I never, I never had to commute. The only commuting I ever did was one, one month I was, uh, my first, my first month on the 737. I got the TDY to um, San Jose. Oh, okay. And they put me up in Fremont and all that. And but that's the only the only commuting I did. I did one month, and that TDY. was it. That's it. Wow. But you know, it's very fortunate. But you also, you know, from what you're telling us about your journey, you you paid your dues with working for so many different operators until you got to a point where you can get a footing in your career. Yeah. So that, that's. I mean, really it, what it's it a is. balance, really. So you were very fortunate. Um, I, too, was fortunate that I've never been furloughed. And I've only, you know, I got one job interview. Well, actually, I had two. But the first one that hired me, that was the last interview I had, which was with Sandpiper. Yep. And then from there, the flow through, I didn't have to interview again. So, I, I, you know, we all have, I guess, highlights to our journeys that we're very blessed about and very fortunate to have. But we also have all those other points, you know, each of us have unique points where, uh, okay, you know, I had to go for an interview cross country, I had to pay for it myself or, you know, so we all have our, our pros and cons. And it sounds like you've been very fortunate with not having to commute. And because that's, that is a it's completely rough. different job. As Alex is realizing now, I mean, you've been commuting now from the beginning of your career here at, at Sandpiper. And I leave tomorrow because my trip starts on Tuesday and it starts at like nine sign in times, nine something in the morning. So I have to be out tomorrow and get a hotel. Yeah. The blessing is that Sandpiper allows us four commuter hotels a month, which is nice so that they don't have to pay out of pocket for right. a night at the hotel. So there's mm -hmm. that plus to it, but it's still like I have two days off, which it's really a day and a half because tomorrow's a commute day. Right. But, but your, your, I guess you can say your blessing is that your first airline, you're getting, you're on a jet. Yeah. I, you're I'm getting paid a, better than me when my first year at, at Legacy Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> We're making for, I think, uh, what was it? Allegiant just came out that their, their first officers are basically pissed off because their first year pay is uh, a less. hell of a lot less than what all the regionals, not just Sandpiper or, or any of the others. All the regionals are now about ninety to a hundred dollars and cheaper than Mesa. Yeah. And and <laughs> and Allegiant sitting there going, Well, what about us? We're an actual like airline, not a regional. Why aren't we getting it? So right. Yeah, all the other ultra low cost carriers like Frontier and Spirit have made improvements and tentative agreements that have increased their pilot pay, even their even their workers or flight attendant pay. But the pilots at Allegiant, unfortunately, have been kind of left behind so it'll be interesting to see we'll, we'll teamsters union just saying um <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what happens with them and we'll we'll talk about that in the future yeah i just peed my pants <laughs> <laughs> please That's leave that in the show yes <laughs> <laughs> so, so where let's see where i am uh, you were so at we, golden we, west we i did the flight instructed and uh I well, I forgot one in there. I left the flight instructing for a while, and I went to Las Vegas for 
Oh, what was the name of the Canyon? Uh, the oh. Canyon Flyers. Oh, um, um, scenic. No, no, there was there was a. Uh, I'll think of the name, but Grand, uh, Can- Grand Canyon but tours. The, the Grand Canyon tour. Flights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went up there, got trained on the thing, and what really, what really uh, hooked it is uh, the chief pilot. After I'm training and everything, and I'm getting ready to fly, and he goes, "Wait, you don't have a, you don't have your ATP." And I said, well, I thought you guys were going to get it for me. And uh, he said, no. Well, I finally, I said, hey, you made me come up here. I left my job. I came up here. And that. And so finally he broke down. And he says, okay, we'll give you the ATP when you take your check right. Nice. And uh, so I flew. Uh, I didn't fly for him, never flew for him. But I was up there. I did uh, uh, IOE just with a guy to see what's going on. And he did a Grand Canyon tour. And I said, this is an accident waiting to happen. Oh. <laughs> they were flying airplanes and they were underpowered. And they, at that time, you could fly 500 feet below the rim. Oh, wow. This was before all the restrictions of the Grand Canyon popped in. And, and, and they were... All the crashes and happened. Well, th- all those restrictions were written in blood, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they... Uh, and... Uh, they were doing it, I was doing it in August, so you can imagine the heat and everything, and it was, and I said, this is not good, and I said, so I went back to my instructing job. They took me back. They never questioned. They just yeah. took, took me back, and I started instructing again. And then you got that interview with um, that guy out of the Pacific Northwest who wanted you to fly, uh, what was it, Air Com- or Turbo Commanders? Oh, he whined yeah. well, and I was, you. there was a guy that... I I was looking. I was always looking for jobs mm-hmm. anywhere, and uh, I I got several ones of them. Um, there was an airline out of Ohio that was. Uh, it was when you got passengers, you got two pilots. When you got cargo, you're single pilot. Oh wow! Out of Ohio, yeah. And I'm talking bad weather. Yeah, at times. Yeah. Blizzard and, uh, snowstorms. So I well, turned it mind down. You, he's a Southern California pilot. He's a fair weather flyer yeah, <laughs> who's never seen snow on an airplane. Yeah. I never, I never um, got it, and I let it go, and everything. And that airline became Comair, if you remember. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I could have been going up the ladder fast because I was uh, one of the first ones that they hired, but. Uh, I didn't want that. I did that a lot. There was a job up in uh, Bellingham, Washington. He was an attorney, and he had a fleet of turbo commanders. Mm. And you would go up to Victoria, Canada. You would fly them to Reno, and then you would take them back. In one day. Yeah, in one day. And uh, I said no to the job. Again. My ability, I wasn't confident enough in doing this. Single pilot, that's why. Yeah. And in weather, you know, in the weather, Northwest and all that. So I didn't. So I said no. Then he flew down (laughs) in a D-18 to Southern Southern California and asked me, uh, gave me more money and wanted me to take the job. And I still refused him. Yeah. Again, this this goes into something where you have to have the confidence in what your ability is. You know, it's not that you want the job. I could do any job, but I got to have the confidence. Yeah. And I didn't have it in all these and everything. So then that's when I went, I asked a guy one time, oh, I got my, my flight engineer. At that time, getting your flight engineer was a big thing. So $4,500, I got it. And I asked one of the guys from there, he's from Arizona, and I said, where do you get uh, twin otter fl- time? Or, you know, how do you get checked out? And he says, the only way Golden West will hire you, you have to go to the factory and take their ground school. So sure enough, I signed up and went up to Toronto, was there for a week, took the, took the factory course, came down. And applied to Golden West, and I got hired. There you go. That was the, <laughs> the picture that I showed you in the office. Mm-hmm. That was in uh, the Toronto Ground School. 
oh, okay. that, that time. Yeah. yeah. So, now, and you said something uh, earlier when we were chatting that you you never want to overextend yourself, especially when you're starting out in this industry. And yeah. it sounds like you were very cognizant of your abilities, knowing that you know your experiences warranted a certain just to be certain about being cautious about what you were going to accept for a job you at a time when you were having job offers really thrown at you which most people would like kill for that kind of thing and you were saying no i it's not for me you know either the operation was not something that you saw as safe or your abilities were something that you saw as not as safe so it sounded like you've always had a, a good head on your shoulders when choosing your career path especially when you're they're talking weather areas and you're single pilot and that I always wanted another guy there at least to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it was. But I wasn't I mean I was cautious and all that but then things like um you dip down on the backside of Catalina Island and fly five yep. feet off the water back yep. home, or you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was oh, allegedly, I'd, yeah. I'd fly up there, and then just before you get to the island, I'd climb up to get to land. I'd take off on the uh, when you take. You've been to Catalina, and, okay. no. In all my in all my time, that's <laughs> on my bucket you list. I've never been to Catalina. Really, like, we the might have airport, to go do that. Airport is away from the city. And it's a, um, they took the top of a hill and they cut it off. You're, but it isn't a perfect cut. It's like this. Ah. So when you land, you don't see the end of the runway. Or when you take off, you don't see it because when you. It's got go, the crest. Yeah. Yeah. And that. So I'd, I'd take off there just to kind of. And then instead of, as soon as you broke ground and went by the end of the runway, instead of climbing, I dove yeah. <laughs> off the cliff and, and went, into, yeah, yeah, and we went down to about island. five feet off the water. And well, mind you, this is all allegedly stuff that allegedly, yeah, allegedly, allegedly, yeah, because yeah. 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 you know, it doesn't matter. I don't have a license, I can't pull it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a the, different day, though, yeah, yeah but, it was a different time, you know. Well, yeah. one of the reasons of doing that is on the backside of Catalina, there was uh, a lot of boats, uh, not near each other but there were boats there and everything and a lot of the ladies were let's just say less than dressed there you go <laughs> <laughs> taking in the golden rays of the sun that's yes. right so, that's right did it. Uh, but uh i so i used uh all the caution i could <laughs> well i had confidence in that's the yeah. thing i was very confident in it and even if the freaky thing came and i lost an engine yeah i had enough ability that i could land in the water and whatever yeah so uh that's just tidbits of it but that's that that's what he was saying is like in your abilities where you're at like he was comfortable doing that but in the Pacific Northwest, where it's rainy and weathery, or in you know Ohio, right. when well, you especially in a Turbo Commander, which I'm I'm not even checked out in yet. Yeah, and you know, yeah, and th there's a lot of parts and pieces that can go wrong because you're not used to it and yep. all that. Yeah, and then and then uh, when I Ohio that uh, what turned out to be Com Air was uh, I think they were four twenty ones, but you'd be flying them single pilot. Yeah, and it's and I I just I didn't do it. Yeah. Every time I hear a single pilot, I think of the future of aviation and all these articles that have been hitting the news streams, the aviation magazines about, are we going a single pilot? I, I actually had a captain ask me the other day, you think that's going to happen? And I always say the same thing, not in my lifetime. I no, really, I, 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 I really hope that I'm right on this because what happens when, you know, God forbid, you got to use the restroom. Mid-flight, which I'm a two-hour guy, so every yeah. two hours I got to... And then, or what happens if you have a heart attack in the middle of your takeoff roll? You, you <laughs> mean like what happened at Sandpiper? Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know? I, had, I had a friend that at, I guess we call it Legacy, um, going to London, and uh, got about Vegas, and he had a heart attack. Oh, that's terrible. But, yeah. And that's the thing, is that's why you need those second pilots. And even, I've seen it with stuff that, we're doing at, at Sandpiper that like we're 
you know, you're, you, you have that second pair of eyes. That's really what it boils down yeah. to is so that like you're putting in something into to the FMS or you're, you know, setting an approach altitude. And instead of putting, you know, 1600, you're putting 1800 or vice versa. Instead of 1800, you're putting 1600. Now you've busted an approach because, oh, I heard 1600. You right. know? Well, the whole threat and error model Swiss, cheese, Swiss model. cheese model, the whole threat and error management model is predicated on trapping errors. Mm-hmm. And if you're the only one in there, no one is there to trap your error. And that's exactly it. That's, that's why two pilots in a commercial airline setting should be the norm. Yeah. I remember in the, in the 70s, early 70s, maybe about mid 70s, there was strikes going on. Um, and it was started with, uh, what's that called? That airline, Weir, Weir Airlines in Alaska, 737s. And the deal was they were going to get rid of the third pilot in the 737, which we call a gib. And United and Braniff and all the others were waiting to see how they would settle on this, if they were going to get rid of the third guy. And if they did, they would do it. And they did get rid of the third guy. So the gib was taken off of all the other airplanes. The only reason I say that is because everybody wanted the third guy because he was the one watching this and looking out for that and doing that. He, there wasn't really a panel back there for him to work, but he would work some of the, the radios and all that, and he would do the company calls and yeah. everything. So is it, did it work out? Yes, it did, but there was a fight over it. Can you imagine cramming three people into a 737? Well, what about the flight engineer? Four? Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you imagine yeah. cramming four people into a 737? Yeah. 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 I I jump I finally got to jump seat on one and that that's smaller than our cockpit jump seat. Well, you know, you've you've jump sat on the legacy seven threes where there's only one jump seat. Yeah. Try jump seating on an Alaska seven three where they have two jump seats. Oh. That storage area behind the captain. Yeah. Yeah. I I can't tell you how many times commuting back and forth to Seattle that I had to go see a chiropractor after we landed because I got that seat, the the second seat, and the yeah. captain, being six foot something, would always bring his seat all the way back to the stop. So I'm literally straddling the captain's seat that's with why my I, back twisted on the on the rivets. That are <laughs> that's why I appreciate yeah. the Airbus because that thing can hold two jump seaters comfortably. Yeah, like and the pilots and everything comfortably. Uh, this is something that for years later, as Golden West went out and all that, uh, I went. My wife worked at Jet America. She had just started there and everything. She met the HR guy, and she get, I get a call from her one day and says, they want you down here, and this is like 10 o'clock in the morning. They want you for an interview. So I went down there. I'm thinking, HR, I'm going to get hired with Jet America. And the guy talks to me, and he says, oh, I like you. And he says, uh, so I went home and I get a call. He says, I want you to come back. I want you to go up with the director of operations here. So I came back and I went up with the director of operations, did an interview with him. And he said to me, he said, hey, um, I, I want, I'm here hiring you, not, not for Jet America, but for a corporate, corporate one that the guy's buying an airplane. Oh. And I said, oh. He says, and I wanted to see you first before I sent you down there, because I didn't know you. And I says, wrong, sir, you did know me. You were TWA uh, chief pilot in L.A., and I says, I was in your office for probably a year, every Monday morning, talking. And I said, because his, his son was a, was a computer engineer also at the time. And, uh, and he said, oh, now I remember you. He was a good old boy. His name was John Rhodes. And is that so I went home again. We were in Torrance. This was all in Long Beach. And then I get another call. It says, I want you to be down here in Irvine at five by five o'clock. And I want you to get an interview with the, the guy who bought the airplane. And the company was called St. John Knits, a very high expensive line of uh, women's clothing, knit clothing. 
I'm not going to go into that, but it was very good. So he said, so he said, okay, I want you to go up with this guy in the airplane. He was selling them this. You familiar with the Macanero Star? No. No, oh, it's it's a highly beefed up airplane, uh, Aerostar, but it's beefed up and it's got bigger engines and it's got more ceiling and all that. At the time when it was out, it was the fastest piston twin on the market. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So I went up and flew around with them, and he came back and he said, "Yeah." He says, "Okay, I want you, I want you back here." I want you back here at six in the morning. I want you to fly him to Shreveport. And I go, oh, and he'll check you out going to Shreveport, and then you'll fly it back. Uh. And I did. And I was a, I was a corporate pilot for them for a while. And then they got a um, Cessna a Citation uh, two, although a single pilot one and all that. But they had two of us in there, and. Um, so I, I flew that, and I had a little while on that. So when, when um, I got hired at Air Cal and I was in training, I did the ground school down here, but I was sent to uh, Vancouver, hmm. and uh, I think it was called Pacific International. And uh, we went to we went to training up. Uh, up in uh, Vancouver, and the funny thing was for me was uh, it was four rides in the simulator. The fourth ride was the check ride. Uh. <laughs> different, and I had I age. had not I had not flown for a year and a half because I, I went back to school, and uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm going, whoa, whoa this, but. Uh, the guy was really good. He said to me, I can see your scan is a little bit slow. And he says, that'll come to you in time. Mm -hmm. And he signed me off. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I went, so, but that was, that was a kind of scary uh, getting it in four rides. Yeah. Yeah. And so you started in Air Cal in eight, uh, 1986? Mm -hmm. 1986. Yeah. July and 5th. So it, Air Cal 737, were you typed already previously? No. no. So this was your type ride, check no, ride? No yeah. type. No type. Oh, yeah, because this was pre-types. Ah, oh, that's right. Yeah. And I was a pre-type, yep. too. I should know this. Yep. Um, so commercial rated well, he, ATP. No, he, he had his ATP. But no type needed. Mm -hmm. So all you needed at those times was just a commercial rating and time in the aircraft to be signed off. Yep. Yeah. 100%. No, no need needed, for a type ride. All you needed was a job. <laughs> wow because i told you before i i had applied for air cal for two or three years or whatever and i sent them a constant one month uh, you know my time would change or whatever rating would change i'd send them the letter and everything a really nice one and mind you this wouldn't hear a thing pre-computers so he's right. doing all these typing yeah, all this yeah, up yeah every single resume and then, uh, xerox uh, copies yep and then I, when I was at Golden West, I was uh, elected to the uh, MEC for ALPA. So we went to a convention in uh, Ball Harbor, um, Florida. And I wasn't much of anything other than I got to go, you know. And, uh, but I met some people there. And I met this one guy, his name was Harvey Siegel. And uh, he and I stayed friends, and he, They'd come out here, we'd go out there and everything. Well, Harvey really became friends with a guy named Steve Fulmer, who was a senior captain. They used to come walk into uh, walk into ALPA. We were all new there. We were new ALPA elected. And he walked in there, and everybody looked at Steve Fulmer and his other guy, John. I can't remember his name, but... And they, they looked at them. They were blonde. They were uh, tanned. They were dressed to the tees and everything. And everybody called them the Balboa Bay Yacht Club. <laughs> and because uh, Air Cal was a pretty good good airline. Yeah. In fact, I would have wished it stayed Air Cal. But things change, and yeah. we got bought out. 
Now, what did Air Cal fly primarily? Uh, 737s, and the last I remember was a Buck 186. They had uh, they had uh, the Super AD and a few other airlines, and they used to fly the Electras. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but basically they had that. And then when we were at, uh, when I was at uh, Golden West, we had gotten Dash 7s. Are you familiar with those? Mm-hmm. Four engine and all that, 50 passengers. And uh, uh, we used to go up to Tahoe. Oh, okay. And that was a very good place to go. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I like to, I always like going into Tahoe. Well, I did it in, uh, I did it with uh, Air Cal, mm-hmm. 737s, yeah, flying wow. into Tahoe. And because the thing is, is the thing for approach is uh, you do the approach into, and you're, you're looking at uh, what was called Heavenly Valley. You, you, that's where your decision point was. Yeah. You either make a left and get out of there, yeah. or you make a right because you Committed. have to see the airport. Yeah. And we'd do uh, the the deal around, and I mean, there'd only be about a uh, hundred feet between you and the hill, and you do the thing. And but it's but it's kind of the same similar approach if you're going into DC, you know, where you're coming in off the LDR, the River Visual, mm-hmm. and you, but you're making your decision right at the point where you're turning into land, right? Not yeah. not coming in and then turning and landing. It's that so, right there. And then making your decision. Yeah, yeah Roger goes in uh, uh, Tahoe or, yeah. quite a bit, and yeah, he he knows all about that. We we have an Aspen special checkout too. Um, I think go to Aspen anymore. You don't go to Aspen? Mm-hmm. No. Um, we might with the Phoenix stuff starting back up. Yeah, and we're getting a lot of uh, Alaska destinations that are starting to pop up in terms of training. Really? So I would not be surprised uh, on our latest recurrent training. Can you believe I actually finished it? It came out two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the nice thing about having these uh, EFBs is um, allegedly while you're in route, you can just like click, click, EFBs, click, click. electronic flight pack. Yeah, which that's, that's what this yeah, is. The, the, so um, w- one, of my, one of my favorites was is, uh, we always had the training in the sim and they did the they did it in LA. So we we go around the patch, you know, or go around the peninsula and then yeah. come back and do a landing there and everything. And I thought it was pretty good because I knew the airport yeah. like the back of my hand. They still yeah, LA used to be uh, LA used to be not a TCA. It was before that. It was just a what do you call it? A control control uh, control zone? Uh, th- you're telling the story. I have no clue. This, and is, this I, is before us. Oh, He's no, talking about pre airspace before, days. Yeah, before, before there was a Bravo or a. Right. It was a TCA, and then before that, it was just a huge control zone. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, I used to, in fact, take uh, get some one seventy two or something. And what you do is you you file for you file for uh, IFR, and then as soon as you get get up, you say, "I want to go on a." What's that when you where you just follow the road? You follow the oh yeah the uh, special VFR corridor yeah yeah, yeah yeah but yeah, there yeah, was yeah. a Council name IFR. for it but I, yeah but anyway I just say I'd do that and so they let me go and I just went over and went into L A nice and uh, I was doing I was at uh, Golden West at the time I went to check my mail because <laughs> 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 we well, at the time there was not the Tom Bradley terminal. Right, right. This was a trailer that was there, and we had some space at the end of it. And, of course, they built that. And this, in fact, the airport was not even a two-decker. It was a single-decker at the time. Yeah. Oh, I'm talking about, we're going way back old. Yeah. You should so, show them the video we have there of the... Oh, the LAX video? LAX. Yeah. yeah. A lot we'll, of cool I'll have pictures. To, I'll have to pull that up for you okay. uh, at some point. It's a good... They talk about... This was this was before I was on the show. You, Roger, and Rob were talking about the history of L.A. Yeah, we did a little mini yeah. documentary on. Yeah. We had a lot of the Lawa Museum photos yeah, on there. Really it was cool. Really cool. But, but going back to, I got a list here. But uh, where, talk about where, your uh, when you were with Golden West and got hired at American. 
I didn't get hired at American. You did get hired at American and got a class date, but uh, the... Oh, oh, that's right. In 1979, I went to American and I got... Uh, a, are you familiar with then you had to go through three phases? Three phase interview process? Yeah. 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 And the second phase is the big... Uh, uh, health thing, uh, medical, yeah, medical. FA medical, medical. Yeah. AA medical. Yeah. 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 I mean, they stick you, they drain you, they do whatever, you know, that I made it through the first interview, which is, um, just the general, general people. And then you go through, you got invited back to the second, which was a major, major medical. And then the third, and then I got invited back to the third one. Mm. And it was the, um, simulator ride with the captain mm -hmm. and he did things like you're doing that out of la and all that and I'm, i got i got the numbers down they gave they gave you the numbers ahead of time and i went through this and i had it down and i'm going and we're flying in and we're getting low and he starts talking to me hey what do you think about this and that and and i knew right then that you just go can we can we do that later I have to the test. Yes, yeah. I'm doing this because he was testing you to yeah. see if you'd get interrupted, and I made that. So I did all three, all three um, phases, and it was good. The problem was the day before this third phase was the crash in Chicago. Oh, American where, Airlines 191, the one where all the engine all of them went off down over the wing. So. There was a month before they would they would go through a month every month they'd have the board and everything, and so I kept calling and the her name was Judy Tarver. She was a real good lady that was the head of a uh, pilot hiring, and uh, she said, "No, you're not. You weren't uh, weren't selected, discounted, or yeah. what was it called?" Uh, Denied. Oh, um, you were. Yeah, you're. You weren't not chosen. Like yeah. you were. You were. You're still in the running. Yeah, I'm in the running now. But I started to learn later that I'm in the running. But they kept hiring. They kept processing the hires. Yeah. But nobody was getting hired. So I was on the list like this. Well, I didn't have a degree then yet, and so I kept. Moving down the list, yeah. yeah. And then finally when they went to go back and rehire and the DC-10 started up, they said um, I was rejected. And, I went, and that was 1970. And that explains why you went back to school to get yeah. your accounting degree. Yeah. That's, that's when uh, I went, went corporate and all that. And some things didn't work out in that. And I said, hey, I got to get, get something going here. So I did a two and a half years of school in a year and a half and got my accounting degree. I was hired by a accounting firm. And I, I, I remember telling them, well, I'll give you five years. If you hire me, I'll give you five years. That will give us a chance to see if I like you and you like me. And I should be what's called manager range. That's when you're in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. And that was, I got hired in January. Of 86. 86. No, that was for, yeah. Yeah. I graduated, yeah. got hired in January of 86. And I was there about six months. And I got, I went for an interview with Air Cal. And the week later, on the 3rd of July, I'll never forget this. They called me. And they said, we got a class opening on uh, Monday the 7th, et cetera, 4th is, anyway, Monday. Yeah. And I said, so he says, do you want to take it? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm right at a company, but they're, we're out for the three days, and I haven't even, and I've got these manuals from auditing and all this and everything. And something finally clicked in my head and said, seniority isn't everything. It's the only thing. <laughs> wow. It's a show title right there. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's a show title. 
<laughs> but that's that's the whole thing, and that's going to the people that are listening to this show. Like when you get the opportunity to go to your first aviation job, don't pass on it. Don't wait. Don't hold back because if he didn't do that, the next class would have been August, which would have been canceled. Which was canceled. Mm -hmm. And then the next class after that was September. And that's about the point that American was starting to. But then then at that point, this other airline went out and it was called Trans America. And they flew uh, C-130s and everything all around the country. So all these guys got the jobs in September. Yeah. And had I not said, I want, okay, I'll take it on July, um, I would, I would probably would have never gotten on the air cal. Yeah. So, um, and then of course, American bought us after that. I was only in, in July, August, September, October, November. For November, I was driving down to Irvine, where the training was. I, we lived in Torrance, and I drove driving down to Irvine. I was what, listening to KFI radio, and uh, I'm by myself and everything. It's about seven thirty, eight, probably that seven thirty in the morning, and I'm going. I'm in the traffic, and then the guy announces KFI. American announces they just bought Air Cal, to, and I go what. <laughs> oh, I said, did anybody else hear that? I'm the only one that heard that and everything. And they bought us. And yeah. uh, it took a while, of course, for all this stock and everything to swap. Sure. But by July, we were operationally uh, American, but we were flying Air Cal. Air Cal yeah, but every, uh, yeah. we got their paperwork and everything. That was them. And uh, that's when my retirement started there. And we'll have more with Captain Daigle right after the break. But the one thing that that did do me, and and I heard it in my mind, and it was like a loud thing, and it says, seniority isn't everything, it's the only thing. And once you get a higher date, that's all that matters. You can get furloughed, but you've got, but you got the that higher date. Higher date. Mm-hmm. Yes, yep. and that's it. American kind of works there. Excuse me. A legacy kind of works it's there differently. Um, they go by occupational seniority. Yes. Mm-hmm. See? Yes. Whereas yep. at Air Cal, you went by oldest guy, youngest guy, that. Uh-huh. So when I was at Air Cal, there were uh, 16 guys. In I was with 22 guys in my class, 16 of them were going to go to the 737, and six of them were going to go to the Bach 146. I was the last 737 guy. Yeah. And I was so happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they, they still do that at Sandpiper. We still break out by different. By um, age. By, well, so there's the cadets, and the cadets are. Oh, that's right. The cadets are all by pen and ink date when they came in for that first interview. Mm-hmm. Then the next is by 121, prior 121 experience. And that literally is just by how much more experience you have. And then there's the rest of us peasants. Yeah. And the rest of us peasants are all by age. Yeah. So when I was in training for Sandpiper, I was the number one in class. Because you're an old guy. Because uh, well, <laughs> at 35 going in class, I was the number one. All the rest are kind of trickled down. So... I was the number one choice, which is why I was able to get the 175 yeah. out of Dallas. Yeah. I, same thing when I flow through to Legacy. Yeah. Um, I, I was in the mid-range in the age group, and we were all just by age at Legacy. And so here we were. It was day to pick. Take your name out of the hat. You're next. And I got the very last Los Angeles Airbus slot possible. And the only reason I got it was because there were two gentlemen that were older than I was that wanted Dallas. They didn't care about the airplane and they picked MD 80 Dallas. Oh, wow. Which, you know, good for them. Yeah. Uh, one of them was retiring within a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And he, he just he went to legacy just to, you know, say he can retire from there. And, yeah. and he was on the, the MD 80 and I looked at him and I went, really, you sure? 
<laughs> and he goes, man, I'm retiring in two years. I really don't care. And I get to drive to work. He goes, that's fine. Take take the Airbus slide. <laughs> well, and you were in class with Kyle, weren't you? Yes. Kyle so was the youngest. One of mm. one of our guys in on the show. He was the youngest guy in class. Obviously, probably didn't get the choice of whatever he wanted in class. He, we got the last slot. Yeah. Which he, was the uh, Embraer 175 out of... The, or the 190. The 190, the 190 yeah. yeah. Every 190 out of, uh, was it Philadelphia? Philadelphia? Yeah. yeah, Philadelphia. Oh, but, that's a good place. Yeah. But they <laughs> <laughs> but they they give you your projection at American of where you're going to be oh, when you retire. Yeah. Do you know what his number is going to be when he retires? <laughs> Here, huh? I'll give you a hint. 3,000? No. Number three? Yes. Number three <laughs> in the company. Oh, I, I could have been more. Yeah, except he was, there was too many people ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> he will be number three when he retires. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, That's I was on the I was on the eighty for uh, I think two years. I hated that airplane. No, <laughs> it, it it just yeah. And then that's when I went to the ten, and I was that was the most enjoyable airplane there was. And the DC ten, you know, there's the. The galley is behind first class. I used to go back there and sit and talk with the flight attendant. I'd go back and have a cigarette. These are days when um, I went back to have a cigarette in the galley in the Super 80. Yeah. Do we still fly uh, L.A., Nashville? And this was the days before the uh, credit cards, and you could earn points and get first class Uh uh uh, before you could do that. I went back there. There were only two people there, and one of them was Dolly Parton. Nice. And so I was having a cigarette, and I, so I went over to say hi and everything. And then the next thing I know, I sat down, and it was like a half hour. With Dolly. Yeah, with Dolly. And the captain had to call up and say, hey, would you send him back up here? <laughs> <laughs> you going to come fly the airplane anytime? All right. I had uh, Lonnie Anderson on recently. And she wasn't really nice. Said hello to us. Oh, WKRP yeah. in Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lonnie Anderson. Yeah, I've had. Um, He's had because of his flying the nonstoppers, especially the red eyes. Yeah. That he'd go to New York. The amount of people that he had on his. Yeah, I bet. Oh. I've had. Um, I mean, I could, yeah, there is one flight a day to from LAX to Nashville. What time does it leave? Five p.m. and gets in at ten fifty. Wow. There you go. I guarantee you there's probably more back in the day, but sure. yeah. I, I had a few uh, Alaska flights. We did them with combis. On the, uh, this is Air Cal. And we went to uh, Seattle, Anchorage. With a, the front half was cargo. Mm. The back half was passengers. Ah. And uh, uh, so this is a funny one is... The guy is flying with was a great guy, and you remember you you remember him, Irving Peel, and he was blacker than the Ace of Spades. I mean, he was black, and we he and I were really good friends. But we would we'd go uh, through security to go get something to eat when we got into uh, Anch- our uh, Seattle, and what we'd do we'd play fun and we'd switch badges. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so he had that was the white guy, and I, I had the black guy on here. Yeah. And you don't want to know how good security is? They waved us through every time. Every time. <laughs> Not much has changed. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, don't get me started on TSA. Oh, no, I know there. I know oh. no crew members change. Oh, it's it's still active and it's still going. Well, now I know, but there's a we use it again now. They got that yeah. girl that went through. Um, San, San Diego, Diego. Right. and she got caught with all the fentanyl. She just claimed uh, not guilty. No, she claimed guilty. Or she claimed guilty, yeah, she claimed yeah, guilty for a lesser it. sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear about that? It's just like, don't get me wrong. I know that TSA is doing their job and they're doing their job for screening, but their primary purpose is to prevent weapons and ter- no weapons and terrorism and basically anything that's going to take down the airplane. Well, under that argument, then how can you explain the TSA agent that gave the box cutter back to the passenger because they pulled the blade out of it, not knowing that there were spare more blades, the blades inside. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, and they're the same as every other department right now that is struggling in a post-pandemic uh, 
career path, which is they have a lot of new hires. I mean, you look at crew scheduling right now at Legacy, it's, it's all, I was just told the other day, it's just a lot of new hires. Sam Piper's the same way. So what's happening is you're getting people that know the job, they've been trained, but they don't have the experience. So these kind of things get through the cracks. The TEM, as we were talking about earlier, is not working the way it should mm-hmm. because there's just too many green, you know, for a lack of a better term, just people that are green. They're just too new. Um, well, you're seeing it at, San, I mean, not, not just with TSA, but it's happening at Sandpiper too. All yeah. the, all the orange vests that we're seeing Everything. out there, Everything. all the new crew schedulers, we were, I was sitting on reserve in September or whenever I was sitting downstairs and they had 15 brand new crew schedulers walking through our operations area. And they're just like, Oh, we just want to see where you guys are hanging out. And we're like, why, why? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, you've had this just wonderful career that has led you through, would you say 10 different airlines or is it more? Oh, no. Um, basically I had five uh, aviation careers five. from, um, uh, instructing to, uh, twin otters, uh, golden, golden west. west corporate air Cal and then American. Yeah. And you got to American with the merger of Air Cal. Yeah. Now, Air Cal's merger with American or American's purchase of Air Cal, however you want to look at it, was one of many that has happened over the last few decades. Yeah. Now, your progression, you were only at Air Cal for a short time, as you indicated. Was that progression pretty seamless? Or was there a lot of bad blood between the Air Cal group and the American uh, group? Or was it more uh, a little more you know generally? What? Uh, there was, but I never really noticed it. I went in, went into my job. I did my job, and nobody really said, "Oh, you air cow and all that." Really. Yeah. Now you got to remember, there were a lot before that. There were a number of purchases, uh, Trans Carib Airlines. They were told it was funny because they they didn't like the way they merged them, especially when their uh, employee numbers. So they, we got told, we're going to change your employee number. Oh. So we got there, and ours was a four-digit number, like 70. Well, you're, just use yours. Yeah, my 7096. 7696. No, no, it's 7696. And they, they changed it. They added 10 onto the end, so it was 107696. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They didn't lie. They changed and, his employee oh, number. <laughs> and every time you wanted to identify somebody as he or Cal, all you had to do is look for the one zero. That's it. And you knew it was him. <laughs> oh, see, this is good tips. And they're yeah. probably... Tony's going pl- to look Cal at both. employee numbers and go, oh, is that an Air Cal guy? Yeah, there's, 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 there's still, still a few There's left. still a few. Oh, yeah. Fortunately for me, you'll like this. It was age 60, retire. Yeah. 14 days after I turned uh, 59, they changed the law to 65. So I had just under a year, and I went and I went, oh, thank you. Because I I can't even tell you how much, not just the flying that I do, but the the, uh, money that was there. It was not the money you guys are making today, but it was... Was good money then. I mean, hey, uh, best I did was two hundred and two thousand dollars on the seven three domestic. Well, that's at the time, yeah, not bad. I mean, things have changed now. We have record soaring inflation, and therefore, you know, you have to. I mean, the contract that they're we've been under negotiation section six negotiations now for how many years, and and they wanted to give us like four or five percent. Increase and it's like, wait a minute, inflation is more than that. We're taking that would mean we're taking a pay cut. So this money game has been. Oh, yeah, can go into a whole other type of podcast to talk about the money game and and what we're worth and all that. But um, yeah, it's it's always been a, a decent job. I can remember as a new hire, a captain told me a story back when he was an FO uh, during the time where they were talking about. Uh, deregulation and joining the Railway Act, 
and his captain, you know, they were reading the newspaper on the flight deck. That's a big piece of paper for those of you that don't understand. It's a big piece of paper that's folded and it's like very like cheap paper and, and it leaves ink on your fingers and it's where the news is printed and you have to physically read it on paper. So anyway, so the newspaper that was, you would sit there and read it and the FO asked the captain, he goes, hey, so if this deregulation thing happens and we all have to take this major pay cut and whatever, what are you going to do? He's like, oh, forget the pay cut. I don't have to quit. He goes, I can't afford to to pay for my house in Aspen and my cabin in Hawaii and, and this and that. He goes, I, I'm not going to be able to afford that. And he's like, well, let's just say they cut your pay in half. And this is back in the 80s. And he's like, okay. He kept this. Well, I might not quit, but I won't like it. And I won't save them any fuel. And I'll just go red line everywhere. And I'll, I'll just, I'll show them. Goes, okay. So they waited like 20 minutes. And then he goes, uh, so Captain, let's say you take that pay cut. Now you're making half. And they go, well, times are not so good. We have to give you another pay cut. What are you going to do? Say they take another 50 grand off your pay for the year. And he's like, oh, that's ridiculous. I, there's no way I can afford to quit. But really, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Make, say, 130, 140, 150,000 a year flying an airplane. What are you going to do? You get a job where? At, at, you know? And he goes, well, yeah, you're probably right. I'll probably stay here, but I'd be really unhappy and like just work minimum shift and not do them any favors. And it got to the point where they were having this discussion on this flight back and forth. He was pissing off his captain, <laughs> you know, and, and finally the captain's like, what's your point? He's like, that's where they got us. We're doing something we love. They pay us fairly, handsomely, you know, back in the day, very well. Um, and no matter how many times they cut, 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 we won't like it. We'll be disgruntled. But where else they got you? Because you're doing something you love. That, but that's also the industry we live in. We can't just take our services from American and go to, to Delta or go to United and say, hey, we've got 25 years of experience. I've been flying the insert airplane here for the last 20 years. Like, let's go over to United and take my skills there. Yeah. No, you're going to start at the bottom again. You're going to be at the base of the pay. You're going to start all over in seniority. All the, all the shit that you had to work through to get up to that 25 years, you start over. It's not like you can be an accountant and be like, I've got 20 years with Coopers and Libran, and now I want to go work for XYZ accounting firm with 20 years of experience. And they go, cool, we'll start you out of 20 years and you're a senior partner and blah, 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 blah. We, we don't have that luxury that other jobs do. So you're right. They basically got us that uh, I'm just going to be disgruntled then. I'll, yeah. Nothing I can do about it. And when the merger with Eric Cal happened, how did they integrate the seniority list with American? Well, they had to fight about it and everything. And I'm trying to remember. Um, they went the first half and they gave them data hire. The second half, they gave it one for five. Oh. Huh. That's where so, I got screwed. That's right. Because you were on the second half? Yeah, because yeah. you're only there a short time. Yeah. 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 But one thing I can say to you guys is uh, for legacy, uh, it's always been that way. They always drag their feet on the on the contract. Yes, and uh, they're always uh, almost the last one to sign. Yeah, and everything. Just about my, the time that they sign, all the other ones are coming out yeah. with new contracts. My yeah. my my personal opinion, they should have never left Alpa. Yeah, because once they left Alpa, they got away from what the industry was doing. They didn't. They cut them off. They didn't talk to them. They didn't do nothing. And only until the maybe mm, the two thousands somewhere, they started uh, making uh, partners with them. And that now they're now they're asking, "Do you want to go there?" Right. Yeah. How, how's that going? Um, well, last I heard, uh, there's been some questionnaires that have been mailed out. I took a questionnaire. Uh, my personal opinion for Legacy Airlines is that uh, Alpa and let's just call it Legacy Pilots Association, they're, the issues that you're going to have are going to be the same. Because mm -hmm. I, was, I was Alpa before at Sandpiper. Um, you're going to have the same people running for the same office and they'll probably get reelected because they have this little popularity that they have. And you're going to have the same issues where the strategy is beneficial to go with a nationally recognized airline union like Alpa is that you will have a national board that will help give you some kind of 
uh, national resources during contract negotiations. Mm -hmm. Like they are now. Exactly. Um, There is, I think, a good time to switch over and a bad time to switch over. The good time to switch over would have been prior to the Section 6 negotiations beginning so that you can get everything settled and management sees that, okay, we have a strong a pilot representation here and they would actually take the offers that are put on the table a little bit more seriously. If you're in the middle of contract negotiations, which traditionally legacy airlines has drug out since 1997, it's worked for them. It's a good strategy because they, all they have to do is drag it out until there's an economic downturn and then go, well, uh, this is all we can give you because look at the economy, look at the market, look at this, look at that. And it's a strategy that has worked. And they have always been the last to do things like signing contracts, getting airplanes, doing things like that. It's been a very long time. It was, what, five CEOs ago? Last time we had a CEO that actually, he might have been a kind of a jerk, but you knew that the buck stopped with him. He, he got the airplanes that he wanted. Crandall. And I know him. He yeah. did. Yeah, you know that guy? Yeah. Um, and so it's been a long time since we've had that. We've, we've since then seen CEO after CEO that has come up through the ranks of the ultra low cost carrier companies. And so they take a different strategy, which is the whole wait and see, let's drag it out. Let's, let's sign these contracts under economic downturns. And I think that the other mainline carriers out there, including Delta, which has always been the premier contract for the industry, for their pilots, I think they're starting to take the same strategies. Mm-hmm. United Frontier, Spirit, all the others, Alaska, UPS, FedEx, all of them that are getting close to doing contracts or in contract negotiations. So I think we have 12 in the U.S. that are under contract negotiations. Say, damn near every major is considered under contract negotiation yeah. right now. So. And they're all saying, oh, we got a TA, we got a TA. And then it gets voted down or, or they pull it back. And it's the same thing because they're all doing this wait and see. Unfortunately, if this continues, we're going to see this drag out until... An economic downturn. Which traditionally, one year prior to a major presidential election, you have instabilities and uncertainty in the markets, which usually create an economic downturn. And we're 12 months away from that right now. I was just going to say, Tony, we're in the year before an economic election. uh, uh, We're going to start seeing campaigns and election cycles starting in November of 2023. Mm -hmm. And it is going to, if we drag this out any further, it's going to happen. Now, I spoke with a Delta pilot who was in my jump seat recently. And, you know, we, Captain and I both were like, so what's going on with this contract? Are you going to sign it? Is this going to happen? And they said that, and of course this is hearsay, but from what I'm hearing is that there are two or three senior board of directors at their union for their pilots that are saying, no, we want more. The pilot group themselves have reacted very positively to this industry-leading contract, but there are a few senior union reps that are saying, no, we want more. We want it. We want so much that it's going to be industry-leading for everyone, bring everyone up. More. More. They want more than what they're getting. Their, con- their TA was incredible. It was incredible, but they feel that they could do more. Now, whether or not this is going to, this strategy will work for them will be interesting to see. Um, But in terms of what are we going to do at Legacy? Are we going to push out the LPA and bring in Alpa? Well, this is like the worst time to do that because now management has stepped back and said, well, you guys need to get your house in order before we can Seriously, come into kind some contract like Congress, talks. Right? Well, yeah, kind of, <laughs> it's funny how this all these politics of the government, politics of the airline industry, and it, it all kind of mends Rolls together. One, yeah, yeah. You know, we used to have a saying. It says Crandall was an asshole, but he was our asshole. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And you know, it, it'll only time will tell what will happen here um, at at American our sister company. Um, and it'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm looking forward to a future that is going to be lucrative. Um, and if we even sign maybe not an equal or better contract than what Delta will sign, because traditionally they've always been better. But if we sign anything comparable to them, I think it's going to be a good thing. Yeah. No, 100% agree. Yeah. And this is our slow time of year right now. January traditionally is the time of year where they're cutting flights like crazy. 
The flights are oversold. The airports are jam-packed. Weather systems, the debacle at Southwest Airlines because of their outdated software system where they lost everybody. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, it only adds to our power mm-hmm. as, a, as a group, as an industry group. Uh, the pilots are in high demand and we can just keep our nose clean, do our jobs and show up and be professional about it and I think it's all going to work out for us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and quite honestly, uh, stick to the contract. Yeah, very important. Yes. Uh, I mean, you can, we always went, depending on times and status, but okay, I'll help you out there. I'll do this and I'll do that. Don't do that anymore. Yeah, don't lean forward is what uh, LPA has been uh, using as a soundbite for us. Um, and, you've, and you've seen quite a bit of this in your time. Uh, you spent, what, three decades at, uh, at American Airlines? Um, 28 years there, and then uh, all the other years everywhere else. Every, yeah. So you have some wisdom to share with us, obviously. I, I do. Um, and we want to get to that wisdom here in a moment. Um, but I wanted to ask you, how many airplanes, in terms of airliners, have you flown? Well, let's see. The Twin Otter, the Short 330, the Dash 7, uh, just airliners. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, and then I did, well, I did corporate. That was a Macanero Star and a. Uh, Count that. Uh, yeah. The CJ2. Yeah, the Citation 2. And then I did uh, 737 100. 737 wow. 200, 737 300. I don't think there was a 400 then. Um, and then, of course, at American, I did the 737 800. I never got to the new one, whatever the max, it is. Max. Yeah. Um, and then I did the DC 10, uh, um, Super 80. And that's pretty much, oh no, 775 no, seven, I did those for a couple of years. 13. What happened was, is uh, I had one of those bids in that I didn't eliminate. Uh huh. And I went to, I said, oh, I, and I called up and they said, no, nope, sorry. You bid it. You got it. Yep. Always know what you have in your That's preference right. <laughs> bid. Nope. So I've flown quite a bit of airlines, of those. And then, of course, in the light in the category of, Small planes. Don't even start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that we'll, be, we'll be here for another four hours on just that. <laughs> oh, Moonies from oh, Blancas, uh, Satabrias. Nice. All the Cessnas. Uh, yeah. And so we, I've, I've done a lot of airplanes. Yeah. Now, it, you're part of the nice thing about this opportunity to explore your journey and thank you again for doing this with us um is because alex was like oh, we got to interview my dad we just have to his history with american and what led up to a fruitful career with them is is how i grew up and alex you've shared a little bit of that on the show with us you've shared a lot of uh, of that <laughs> uh, yeah. you know as we were talking here getting to know each other over the last few years um i want to know like when you came into the picture, that you you always told us how going to LAX as a kid, you know, hopping on the back of my dad's airplane, yep. you know, going up to the cockpit, sitting up there, yep. you know, and traveling around the world. I mean, that must have been pretty cool to grow up in that light. But for your father to have his wife and son come along how was that for you was that just like come on over i I always enjoyed it i I appreciated it every time mostly for her um in fact my last real layover was in new york and they canceled the, the middle flight so i went went into new york and i had all the saturday and then sunday at night i would go out so we had all that time. She went directly, uh, nonstop on the, was it the 10 then? No, it wasn't the 10 then. When? When she went, it, it was on one of the big airplanes. What was it? 
the seven six seven six and uh i went i had to go to dallas and to uh yeah. LaGuardia, and there was some funny stuff is uh she was sitting there in the front of the hotel going okay where are you now <laughs> and i i go look in front of you i'm right there <laughs> <laughs> nice well there there's stories of um when i was stationed in in virginia living in norfolk uh that my mom was traveling with him and was literally standing at the that gate. was that same yeah, flight the same so that was the start of the flight mm. where she had she got there early and she went through grand central station and met my dad at the hotel and then they did a couple days in new york and she got to the gate and said okay i can go back home i can go through dallas and go with him or I can go here and I can go hop over down to Norfolk and go see my son. And so she made the last second decision and came down and visited me. Nice. So, uh, it, but that's the, the world that we grew up in. The, the, this was post 9-11, but the pre-9-11 world with the non-rev, flights would go out 60%. You know? Right. You, I think the only time was, what was it, in Boston, where you were on the plane and we weren't sure if we were going to get on or not. Oh, that was funny. Yeah, I was breaking down. I was like six or seven years old, and I didn't <laughs> comprehend how it worked. Just figured we're getting on the plane with Dad. And I'm breaking down in tears at the gate while they're getting ready to push. And at the last second, they said, hey, here's two seats. Let's go. So maybe you're the reason that they, you guys got on at the last second. Yeah, they're like, good oh, poor kid. <laughs> but, but that was the days. Like, like I said, we, I used to be, we used to go down in LAX Ops, the same ops that's there, and be down there with him. And... They'd go out, have a cigarette, and I'd be standing out there, six, seven years old, looking up, and there's a DC-10, there's a 767, you know, the pictures I was just showing you. Yeah. Like, I was that. I, that was me. I was there. Like, the, the smell of burning jet fuel still holds a special place to me because that's the, the smell that sparks the memories of all that. Yeah. So it was just, it was a good time to, the 90s was a great time to, to travel. You know, I got to, to be across the U.S. Like, there was a trip that he did. With the DC-10, he had transcons, right? So he would LAX to, to New York. He brought us with him. It was, uh, oh, you remember uh, this? Yeah, yeah, I had two, two, back, two back-to-back trips. I'd go and come back, and then the next day I'd go and come back. Well, um, they stayed in my room, and then I rented the room for the one day that I wasn't going to be there. So they stayed three days in New York while I went choo-choo. Mm-hmm. and all that and the only reason why i remember when it was in time frame it was 1998 because titanic was all the rage and they did there with my mom and i saw some off-broadway production of a titanic play or whatever so the only reason why i remember the time was like 1998 ish but there was a whole day in new york where we were just there on our own going yeah. around new york city yeah and that's when it was safe oh <laughs> wait wait when was this <laughs> the 90s your time at American, there's got to be a trip that stands out, like just was a memorable trip. There were so many memorables. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the celebrities that you've had on. Yeah, I've, uh, I've even had Michael Jackson on. Wow. When I went, uh, I went up to him because he has a bodyguard on the aisle and he's on the window. And I just went and leaned over to see him and I said, how are you, oh, Mike? <laughs> you had the mask on, <laughs> so I wasn't worried. No, that was he was on. We had uh, Mike Tyson. Oh, Mike Tyson! Oh, Mike Tyson was a trip. Yeah, pre-tattoo was, Mike Tyson. Uh, yeah, but, <laughs> but he, he was out in the out in the jet bridge, and I went to walk out for whatever reason, and uh, and he goes, I said. Mr. Tyson, how are you? Very fine, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he has a high voice. Yeah. Mike, just, uh, Mike Tyson, uh, Michael Keaton. When yeah. Batman was big, I have an autograph from Michael Keaton. You don't say. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was a trip because this was a time when first class was not that full. Yeah. You had to pay the money. Yeah. You weren't upgraded into first yeah, class. Right. Yeah. And, On a transcon. And so... I used to fly the Red Eyes to um, New York, and we'd take all the celebrities who had to be on the morning talk shows. Yeah. 
And so they'd all go there and everything. And, and Michael Michael Keaton was on there. And I saw him and I and I went, he was awake and everything. And I said, uh, I don't mean to bother you because I don't like to bother the celebrities. And I said, but can I get a, can you sign a thing for my son? Because he loves you. He was about four or five. Four or five, yeah. And he signs, Alex, be a good guy. Michael Keaton, Batman Forever. Nice. <laughs> and he, we still have that. Uh, uh, I know you had yeah. Beverly D'Angelo because I have that one. Uh, yeah, the the um, wife from Vacation mm-hmm. um, had her on it because he got, uh, hers was May All Your Vacations Be Wonderful. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And then going to Miami, we had a lot of celebrities. Uh, Gloria Estefan. Uh, one of my favorite was uh, I had Sean Connery. And he, he was just the gentleman, but, but he looks so distinguished, didn't he? You know, on that beard and everything. I loved him. Um, what about your girlfriend? And then Barry, uh, Barry Gibb, I had him. Oh, you girlfriend. Say. Yeah, your girlfriend, uh, Carrie Underwood. Oh, well, Carrie Underwood. <laughs> she signed uh, with love, Carrie Underwood. Oh. And then I got, uh, what's the... Uh, Legal, legal blonde. Oh, uh, oh Reese yeah. Witherspoon. Reese Jeez. Witherspoon. Yeah. She yeah. signed the same thing and everything. So he's got yeah. two two wonderful wow. girlfriends and Carrie well, Underwood and Reese Witherspoon. That nice. was when I was doing the, the L.A. Nashville flights. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's where they were going. And Dahlia, Dahlia Parton, too. Yeah. And so it was, yeah, a lot of memorable ones. Now, of course, you know, one of the common topics that I always was interested in when i started this podcast back in 2019 was how do you deal with conflicting personalities on the flight deck now someone like myself maybe a little bit more so than alex here who's been in the industry only a few years in the airline world you really don't have many of those conflicting personalities anymore but i've heard stories about back in the day when the captain's always right, that's rule number one. Rule number two, when the captain's wrong, the captain's see rule number one. The captain's always right. Um, you must have had some run-ins with a few pilots. Have you ever had an incident that... Oh, yeah. Yeah? That you'd I like to share? I remember right now. <laughs> oh, man. The fact that he's this quick on it. He's like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There was this girl that was a flight engineer on the 10. I was co-pilot. And there was the captain. This captain had a very big reputation. As an example, when you, the flight attendants come up and say, okay, uh, 176 people, uh, whatever, and everything, he'd say, okay, he'd get up and he'd go check every door in the air, airplane yeah. that was armed and make sure it was armed. So he didn't trust his. He didn't trust anybody. Crew. He'd been burnt something way in the past. I'm not gonna, I don't even know the whole thing. So we had this female flight attendant. She and I got along pretty well. Um, her name, let me think of her name. Uh, but anyway, so we're getting ready to come back, and we're flying, and he goes, I was going to wait until we got in, and I was going to talk to you. He says, I want to tell you... Uh, You've been sexually harassing the the engineer. Yeah. And I said, what? She said, what? (laughs) And he went through this diatribe and had the book out and he was reading this and doing that. And I go, there was nothing, couldn't convince him because he was all ready to do this. And that, um, it was just, so finally, I just, I just uh, put my feet up, I put my head back, and I said, it's all yours. And I didn't do anything the rest of the flight. And yeah. I sat there just, you want to you wanna be that way? You can do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so he was just, just trying to give you a hard time? No, that's the way he was. He just was like that. He was, he was an a-hole. Yeah. And, uh... uh well, you know, she was even saying, wait a second, don't I get any say in this? And he goes, no, you don't. Oh, <laughs> well, and you also got to remember, this was, they were hardline bidding. 
And when you got your bid packet, yeah. you got them for the month, the whole month. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was how it was, you know? And, but that was also part of the fun of when we were growing up is he'd get the bid packet by like trip two or three mom and I were coming with him. So the flight attendants already knew us, the, the cockpit crew already knew us. Like they knew everything about us already because he's sitting here talking like, Oh yeah, no, well, on the New York trip, my, my family's going to come and you yeah. know, talk it all up. But when you're stuck with them for a month and you have personality conflicts like uh-huh, that. Uh-huh. <laughs> majority, majority of the guys were great and easy to talk to. And I used to fly this red eyes with, on the 10 with this uh, guy, his name is Steve. I just, that's all I remember. He was an older guy. And I, I'd go and every few miles I'd say, oh, wow, Steve, we only got 2,136 miles <laughs> <laughs> to go. And then, Maybe 10 minutes later, I'd say, wow, Steve, we've only got 2,040 miles to go. (laughs) This makes the night go longer and longer. (laughs) But I did get to see, um, going on the 10, uh, mostly, uh, we were coming in to the floor. We'd go across the water, the Gulf, and uh, coming in to... Miami, but we'd still be out in the Gulf. And uh, it was uh, two or three times um, at the early morning, because I was doing the red eye, the space shuttle was launched. Nice. So we're sitting here, and we're only 50 miles from Canaveral or whatever it is. Yeah. And I'm watching it all go up and yeah. just going up and everything. It was really a beautiful sight. Didn't you have a story where you... Yeah. Yeah, I saw the final space shuttle launch over Orman Orman VOR, and uh, we were at thirty seven thousand feet on our way to Miami. And air traffic control goes, uh, "Make a right turn at thirty degrees." And we're like, um, "Okay, what's going on?" Like, "Oh yeah, they're they're about to launch the shuttle. You might get a good view." So the captain goes into half bank. <laughs> and we're doing this half bank turn to the right. Oh, oh, Meanwhile, slowly. I'm reaching in my kit bag, <laughs> looking for a little point and shoot camera I used to keep. And so I'm here sitting there going, you know, taking all these pictures. And sure enough, uh, I got some pretty good shots there up on the website, actually, under the uh, the flight line photos tab. Let's see if I can find yeah, them. Real quick. I don't. Yeah. I don't remember when when these were because because uh, these were they were kind when they were shooting them up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So. Yeah, and it's it's one of the highlights. And actually, the captain I was flying with during that space shuttle launch, she was, uh, she was so moved by witnessing this that she had a tear or two, and she said, "You know what? I've lived a very long life." She was getting ready to retire. She says, "I, you know, I'm a, one of the first women in the airline industry. I've I've struggled. I've seen some things, but this is definitely the highlight of my career." Oh, yeah. Where'd you get that? That's his photo. Oh. That's the one he's talking about. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what it looked like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's, uh, and there's uh, one, I think that was the Delta rocket one. There's another one oh, yeah. during the day, which is uh, the actual shuttle. Okay. And, and they're different. The Delta rocket goes up uh, and just, it's kind of steady in its path. But the space shuttle, it just kept accelerating and kept accelerating and kept accelerating. That's that it. That's it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've seen one in the day. I mean, do you remember Mark Kelly, the one who got elected to uh, oh, yeah. Congress, was yeah, an Arizona astronaut? Guy. Uh-huh. Um, we went down to uh, Miami. My wife and I it was like vacation, two weeks off because we went up to see him. Mm-hmm. We went to places. Was back. this the cruise where she tripped in the parking lot? Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> it was a, it was there was something at the hotel or something, and there was like divot in the ground, and she did it. She, it was as big as a body. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she, um, we were going to go see the last. I think it was the last space shuttle. I don't know if it was, but um, but they c- canceled it. Uh. So we went down to uh, Key West and all the other stuff. Oh, that's when you did the the drive. They drove from Key West all the way up to see me in Virginia. Oh, cool. Well, that's because we were going up. Could you try again? 
<laughs> wow. So we were going to do that. We went we went to things like St. Augustine, Savannah, yeah. uh, Charleston. Charleston? Yeah. Charleston. And uh, we went to Kitty. Did we go to Kitty Hawk with we, you? Yeah, we went to Kitty Hawk together. Okay, we yeah, went to Kitty that was Hawk. in like 2009-ish that we went to Kitty I Hawk. Remember. I if barely you, remember. If you haven't been, you need to go. Ticket. My first, my first experience uh, flying for an airline. My captain's was. It's a story I've told a hundred times. I won't tell it again today. But you know, he's like, "Oh, you're just, our alternate's not good. You need to find us a better alternate." You know, we're going to Dayton, and Cincinnati was our alternate. He's like, "Gotta find us another airport." I'm like, "Sir, uh, I, I grew up in in California. I don't know anything east of the Colorado River. You're gonna have to help me." <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So yeah, no, I have not been to Kitty Hawk. Um, I all things that are on my bucket list, and I I don't know. I guess I'm waiting till I'm old and forgetful to do. <laughs> to do that, that's the one thing I'm happy for him, and that is is he was flying in all California just like I was. Yeah, and Golden West was was uh, we didn't even have radar it, because we have by uh, data. We have less incident of thunderstorms in California than they do in Hawaii. Yeah. And so we didn't need it. That. So, uh, so I didn't get a lot of, I got a lot of fog. Uh, sure. You know, maybe a little rain here and there, but nothing. And, uh, but once I got out of California, where I really learned was when the weather, I mean, when you're doing cat threes in the Washington, D.C. or to yeah. New Orleans. and Had, uh, had to do a cat two in uh, um, Kansas City the other day. Yeah. Um, obviously, I don't fly it. The captain does. But we're down to 100 feet like before you're yeah. seeing anything. And that, like, actually doing it for the first time, it's pretty eye-opening. Yeah. Like, it's so pretty when, intense. So when, you, so when you get out of California... And you start seeing it. And I've been in snow and ice and everything. I've seen it all and everything. I'm happy for him because he's finally getting some experience. Yeah. I actually, we have a good, I have a good story from this last trip. We were in Chicago um, in the, the H gates and we, it was, there's frost on the wing. So, and it wasn't snowing. So it's just like, okay, we need to just. Get some type, type one. one, yeah, yeah. Type one, blow us off, and we'll go take off. Right. Type one's about forty-five minutes for holdover time, and I love the Hots app. Like that is, yeah, amazing. Like amazing. Oh, we have an app on our iPad that it does all the calculations for you, mm-hmm. and all you do is just put in like the time and where you're at and everything like that, and it tells you like this is your hold, like that this is your holdover time, and this is your. <laughs> This is your, uh, this is basically your release. You need to be off the ground by this time. And our, we got type one and we got a new guy doing type one for us. And he took 13 minutes to spray down the plane. And then we had to wait 10 minutes or so because the alley was just, people were coming in and out and we're coming, we're trying to get everything through, get going. And our tax, our captain's taxiing at the, you know, the speed of heat. To try to get us down to, we were going off of two two. Okay, <laughs> so you're trucking along. Oh yeah, we're trucking. And what airport is this? Chicago. Oh, I've been there. And uh, we get out the gate. We get there. We get rolling. We are on the takeoff roll when our holdover time expires. Like I mean, like the skin of your teeth yeah. close to it oh, wow. being like not. I had a captain in the ten. And I don't remember the whole thing, but we had a holdover time, and we exceeded it. And I said, Captain, I just want to let you know, we've exceeded the holdover time. He said, okay. And he kept going. Yeah. He kept going. <laughs> and then once we got down to the runway, I said, Captain, we've exceeded. Because I'm there to advise, and if he accepts the advice or not. Exactly. Yeah, I knew he knew. This will do it. This is a high lift wing on this and everything. And uh, but I knew, but I had to say it right in case it comes out on the investigation. It's in the recorder. <laughs> oh yeah, because every every landing, all the just a few feet off the ground, no matter what. I said, you know, if it was me, Captain, I'd go around. 
<laughs> Man, you're, and I'm learning this that you're quite the prankster. Now I know where this guy gets it from. This is amazing. Um, you know, the, it, there's a, it was a different time. There was a different time in aviation, and I, I can remember flying with a captain out of LaGuardia. It was one of my last trips as a first officer over at Sandpiper. And the ADA said, you know, overcast skies, light flurries, but no snow reported. And the aircraft on the walk around was clean. I thought, well, okay, uh, we're a clean, air, clean bird, Captain. I don't think we need to get the ice. We could probably get out of here. He goes, okay. So as we're taxiing out, all of a sudden, this flurry just passed right through, and it's just like this. It's super cold. The snowflakes are huge. You can actually see the snowflakes. And I'm, I'm looking at the captain. I'm like, um, do we need to go back and get de-iced? And he goes, are you kidding? When I was a young FO, we used to de-ice with a broom. Nobody had de-icing. This is just ridiculous. <laughs> this is going to pass. It's too cold. It won't even stick to the wing. Let's just get out of here. We're, we're going to... No. I was like, um, okay. And meanwhile, I'm looking and it's like, now it's like coming, really coming down. Yeah. And then you hear this MD-80 go, uh, yes, yeah, the American, uh, flight, whatever. Uh, we're going to go back to the gate and get DIs. And then you hear Southwest. Yeah, we're going to go back to the gate and DIs. And the ground controller goes, uh, Sandpiper, are you going to go back to the gate and DIs? I look at the cap and he goes, I told you no. I'm like, uh, negative. <laughs> Oh, we Did took off. off we took off and he was right it was just a flurry that came through it was never even printed on the ATIS. so i mean unless there was an fa inspector with binoculars going uh, at that side of the airport you know what's what's it doing <laughs> yeah. um and, and it didn't stick it was fine now in today's world where liability is what rules the world now especially in this industry I would elect to go back and I'm like, hey, I get paid by the minute. I don't care. I'll just go back and get de ice. I'm not paying for that de icing fluid. Yeah. What do I care? And it's always better to err in the side of safety. And that's what I'm promoting now here today on this show and, and also on the line. Uh, but back then, it just, you just had these personalities like, ah, it's not going to, I know well, better and I'm going to go. And it's funny you say that because when I was in, when I was in New Orleans on New Year's Day, I showed you the pictures of how fogged it was. Yeah. There was the conga line, and we were like 17th in line because New Orleans is a beautiful airport that sits near the coast, right? And it's in low banks and gets insane coastal fog, just like LA and the Southern California region does. But one of my best Cat Threes was there in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, where I couldn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nothing. Yeah. 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 Well, so that's that's the morning that we had. It was it was a? I think they said at one point RVR was down to like. Um, like 300, 300, 200, and I don't forget what the other one is, but I mean, like low, like nothing, yeah. right? And um, the all the planes are in the conga line waiting on the side of the airport. But the problem is, is there's no wind coming to kind of lift the fog, and there's no planes coming in to move the fog. The reason why there was no planes coming in was because their high intensity runway lights. Ah. Uh. On the side of the runway. No tamed out? No. There were uh, 19 of them on one side, and 21 of them were out. Their limit was five per side. So they're not able to get planes in, and the RVR is too low for everybody's takeoff is, you know, because we all have company pages and whatever. I think ours was, if things were working, we could go down to 600 is what company pages say. Yeah. Um, and, but here's this United plane. It, RVR's five five five, cool. We're going. Mind you, there's a couple other United planes in the queue that are sitting there going, well, "We're not going." You know, everybody's sitting waiting to go. Right. But this guy is kind of one of those, probably one of those older captains. Oh, I've seen this before. We're fine. I can see the run. I know the book. Yeah, the I book know. Says I, I can go I, in five five five. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go five five five, and we're we're gonna go. And it, and sure as shit, he took off and he was gone. And did he move the fog enough to? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you need a the ground personnel with a leaf blower up there on the transmissometer. It's yeah. blowing. The, oh yeah, no, I remember a good. guy. We we is in the Twin Otter. Believe it or not, there was one red eye at at Golden West. Yeah, but what you did is you got in like midnight or midnight one o'clock, and they called it the Inya Kern Hilton, and you went and slept in the back room of the 
uh, it isn't really classified a red eye. Yeah. So you're supposed to be awake in like four hours and everything. Oh, it's one of the continuous duties. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Stand up. Yes. Yeah. Sleep there. And then you get up and it's early, early morning. And they had the, the dew that settles. Mm -hmm. So ice came on the wings. Oh. And we didn't have de-icing. Yeah. So the captain, and I, I was kind of leery at all this. He had, he threw a rope. <laughs> over the the wing and I had to get the other side and he wanted and we took it and drug it down the wing and basically got the ice off and <laughs> did it on the other one and, and we took off. I was kind of like I was new and I was going oh yeah. I don't know this. Yeah I don't know. Yeah I, I, one of the stories they told me in uh, recurrent ground school one time was don't be this guy and he, they told this assistant chief was teaching the class that day because the, the ground school instructor, for whatever reason, couldn't make it. So the, this assistant chief came in to teach a class because he used to be a former ground school instructor. And he was saying, yeah, let me tell you about some of the things I deal with over in the chief pilot's office over in Dallas. And there was a, over at Sandpiper. And there were two flights that spent the night in Mexico. One was like Chihuahua, and the other one was like an airport that's maybe 50 miles away. And the one airport, I forget, the exact airports, but the one airport, the flight left on time. And at the other airport, the flight took a three hour delay because they had frost in the morning and that station didn't have de-icing. Neither did. None of them in Mexico did at the time. So they were like, well, we got to wait until the sun comes up and melts the frost on the wings. And then once we have a tactile check is complete, we can go. So knowing this, the chief, the assistant chief pilot at the time went to the gate on the inbound aircraft that was on time to ask them, you know, what's going on? Uh, because he thought right away, these guys were probably out drinking la late last night and they're delaying the flight so that they can make sure that if they got breathalyzed, they, they'd pass, you know, something, some shenanigan like that. Yeah. And <laughs> he was on the jet bridge. And when he saw the captain uh, come off the airplane to ask him about that what the conditions were like, the FO is sitting there shaking his head in the cockpit and he can see this and he thought, what, what's going on? The captain was soaking wet from the chest down. What had happened was there was frost on the wings. So what he did is he told the station, go get me two buckets of hot water. And he went on each wing and he would throw the hot water on top oh, of the wing God. and it circled around and it just at the wing trailing edge of the wing root. It hit him in the chest, so he got soaked. Then he went to the other wing with another bucket of hot water, did the same thing, and he goes, okay, we can go. And, and the chief pilot knew exactly what had happened when he saw him, this gentleman, this captain, soaked from the waist down, from the chest down, and he goes, what did you do? He was like, what? I'm the captain. I'm a qualified dancer. He goes, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so in an effort to try to catch these other the other crew that did the right thing yeah you know he actually had to have a talk with that captain who did his own de-icing with a bucket of hot water but yeah he's, did it work well, <laughs> hey he made it so well, did yeah. your rope trick work uh, apparently yeah, <laughs> yeah i mean well don't forget um a twin otter is a very high lift wing oh yeah so and it's a straight wing so uh, apparently a must have worked and uh, not yeah. that. But yeah, that one in New Orleans, I, I really remember it. Just to give you an idea, I guess they're 25 feet, the uh, green lights. Mm. Is that right? I, it sounds right. Yeah, every 25 lights, feet. Yeah, it sounds that, about right. That's as many as I can see is two. Two. So 50 feet. Yeah. Yeah. To RVR of uh, 0.5. I, I went into uh, this, is a long story, not a long story, but it's. We came from Toronto to L.A. L.A. was almost zero, zero. So we dropped the passengers off in Ontario. So I'm talking to dispatch, and he says, well, I really don't need the airplane in Ontario. I need it in L.A. And I said, well, you put enough gas on, and I'll go try, you know. And The caveat to this story, this is on the 7-3, I know this story. This was pre HUD seven three. Yeah. Okay. Pre HUD. That's right. That that's a that's an important factor to the story because so, with the HUD they could have gone down to nothing. To nothing. To yeah. zero, zero. But we would uh, come in, set up for the approach, get all ready. It was below minimums when we hit the marker, so we went around yeah. three and a half hours. 
<laughs> You're just holding and yes. trying, holding. Yeah, trying. we're going out and going there and going to Rose Hills, you know, way back here and yeah. coming to another one. Then one time it went down to 1,200 or came up to 1,200, which is our minimums for cat two. And we went on. It went, it went below it once we went past the yeah. thing, but we made it. And we didn't have a HUD at the time, no HUD and everything. So it was all raw or regular flying. Yeah. And we made it. The problem becomes now we got to get to the gate and it's zero, <laughs> zero. And I mean, it yeah. is zero, zero. Yeah. I, so I crept. And I finally found the the high speed at which you exit on down near the end. And I crept. And then we got permission to cross. And I crept it and I crept it. The only thing that got me to the gate was I'd been to Americans Terminal hundreds and hundreds of times. Yeah. And I knew my way. And I just I barely moved this thing, but we got yeah. it. One taxi light at a time. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. I just yeah. did it. <laughs> yeah. What's what's the over at Sandpiper, the minimum for takeoff? Is it three three three? Uh no, we're uh well it depends on what we have working. It's um five or six six six, I think. Six six and six. Yeah. So my only time that I've taken off six six and six was in Fresno, California. And they get that early morning fog. And uh I gotta tell you there was a follow me truck that the captain was supposed to follow. Couldn't see the, the kid in that truck was doing like 30 miles an hour. <laughs> so we lost the follow me truck. Yeah, it was the same thing. We stopped the airplane and we told the tower, yeah, you got to tell that truck that there's no way. Yeah, we can't see the follow me truck. Yeah, no, we, I, know, I, yeah. Don't, I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, things I can say on this broadcast that what we did in Bakersfield. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's classic. Yeah. So, um, if you could give advice out to the young aviators today, what advice would you give them and why? Get a, another job. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? If you, if you really want to do it, I mean, if you're really heart set on it, you're going to find a way. There's so many different ways of going. I did it my way. You did it your way. You did it your way. And we're going to do it. But you're going to get there if that's what you really, really want. You can't give up. And it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a thrilling job. I'm, uh, I'm so grateful for it. You know, the more I look back on it, I'm so much gratitude. It's uh, unbelievable. I've been ahead of my hard knocks in that in a way. But, uh, yeah. but, it, but it, it's, it was a great life. Yeah. Fortunately, it's... Uh, if it, if it isn't the inflation, um, this will retirement will carry me through and everything. Yeah. Now you're retired in 2013 at the age of 65. Yes. And it, so you've had what eight, nine, ten years now. Nine, nine years. Nine, nine, nine and, and a half. half. Yeah. Yeah. Nine and a half years in retirement. What can you tell us about your feeling about the industry and your career now that you've had a decade, pretty much to that you've been out of it. Did you, you still miss it every day? Uh, I have things of, you know, just being up there and looking around and the noise, you know how it goes, the, the chatter and that, but quite honestly, I'm not missing it. I told you, we have a couple friends that I keep in contact with. And I said, boy, aren't you glad you're retired? And I go, yeah, I think I did. I think we got at the end of the, what I'd call, the old old uh, ways of doing things. Yeah, uh, nine eleven, of course, changed a lot of stuff, but we had a lot of good times. Yeah, except now you you can't even joke with the flight attendants. You say something dirty, <laughs> slightly <laughs> dirty. No, you can say something oh, slightly. Yeah. I told the flight attendant a, a off color joke. I don't know if I should tell it here. <laughs> Man. If it doesn't work out, we'll we can always out. edit it out. Yeah. yeah. It's the one about uh, Neil Armstrong. Oh, God. Neil Armstrong, when he was a kid, lived <laughs> next to uh, Manny, and Manny King. And the, they were playing ball, and the ball went over his head, and so he went to get it, and it was right below their window. And uh, the lady in the 
her wife said, oh, yeah, I'll stick that thing in my mouth the day that kid walks on the moon. So one small <laughs> step for man, one giant leap for Manny King. <laughs> That's it. So I told that to a flight attendant, and I went up to the cockpit, and another one comes up and says, she's, she's thinking of turning you into HR. Yeah. And it wasn't, it, to me, it wasn't a dirty, it wasn't a dirty joke. It was an off-color joke. Oh, it, was, it wasn't directed towards someone. You weren't trying to insult anyone. It was just a dirty joke. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I hear comics on stage all the time, especially now, saying you can't, oh, you, it's, that's, that's the whole point of being funny, of telling jokes, is to be able to laugh about stuff. And the more we laugh about ourselves, especially... I think the healthier we are, mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right. And in the last probably ten years that that I've been out there on the flight line, you can't tell. I'm I'm a joker too, and, and you know I've got to be really careful mm -hmm. because I don't tell jokes to any flight attendant can't. anymore. I yeah. don't, none. Well, not just flight attendants. The pilot next to you, you know, yeah, you you don't yeah. know who you're flying with. You're meeting them for the first time, or even you've flown with them, and you had no idea that. They enjoy dressing like a streetwalker in the middle of the night at the hotel. I mean, you have no idea what's going on. So you can't even joke about stuff. Oh, no. You can't dress like that? No. Oh. That's what they said. <laughs> but, but if you do, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't make a comment. Yeah. You yeah, can't no. make a remark. Yeah, it, it changed. It really changed the things. I mean, I, I wasn't really doing it too much anymore, but that really put the to bits on it uh, yeah yeah um i said no um <clears throat> the so one of the other questions that i have is going through your career and knowing what you know now about everything and building up and all that stuff and one of the struggles that he actually didn't talk about that he faced in his aviation journey which i'm surprised you didn't was he came in the post vietnam era of aviation which for a general aviation guy like we all were we weren't military trained um it was tough finding a job because you were competing with a guy who just came off out of vietnam yeah. who's got several thousand sorties flying and yet he's got you know two thousand hours and a 172 right who are you gonna take and who are you gonna hire Right. But knowing what you know now of everything going back through your whole career, what advice, if you could take your younger self aside and whisper it into his ear, what would you give yourself? I, I don't know. I, it's, uh, I was a civilian pilot and never did the military. Um, I was in the military, but I didn't do it right. It's hard to say. I remember being at, 1976, I was in a continental interview. I had maybe 1,500, 2,000 hours total. Cessna 150. Well, a bunch of the other things, but basically. And uh, one of the questions they asked me, and they said, we've got a 5,000-hour F-4 pilot here, and we've got you. Why should we hire you? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. And I, I sat there, and I, I didn't answer right away. I just sat there for a second and thought. Now, what I should have said is, well, he's a very competent pilot. I said, but <clears throat> nobody wants this job more than me. I will work hard and do all that. That's what I should have said. What I said was, I don't know why you'd hire me either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can see why they didn't. They didn't hire you. <laughs> no, they didn't. Yeah. But it was a good, uh, I mean, it was, everything was for experience. Yeah. Whether you broken hearted or not about it, yeah. it, everything was experience. Right. And that's what I say is uh, I've enjoyed my career. Um, I've had ups and downs and uh, things, you know, sometimes I don't like flying the red eye. But I did it. I never went to work thinking it was work. Yeah. That's the big thing. I never thought it was work. Yeah. I just had to go and do this event. And uh, I enjoyed every minute of it, especially now as I look back. Yeah. Now, a lot of 
talk has been circulating in our industry about the FAA changing the standard to a retirement age of 67 and a half and potentially a few years after that, upping it to 70 because they have all this data indicating that people are living longer, they're living healthier. And to think that you work in your career field until 65, 67, 70, and then you're not going to retire till you're 70. And let's just say you live, you know, maybe a couple decades after that, you're spending your, the bulk of your life working. When do you, when do you enjoy yourself? If they do change that and you have pilots that are on the fence at 65 or getting close to it, what, what advice would you have for them? Would you tell them, get out while you can and enjoy your life? Or would you say, well, if you love your job, go do your job? Well, that's it. If you love your job, go do it. Uh, uh, and those that uh, think they should quit at 65, that's fine too. I really don't see, this is, I've always been an advocate of this. First of all, you got to remember, I was very lucky because uh, 14 days after I was 59, they changed the law to yeah. 65. You got to do it five more years. Five more years. And uh, I loved every minute of it. I don't even want to go into the, the, the amount of money that I made, not the paycheck money, but I'm talking about because I didn't have this, I didn't have that, or I could do that, I could do that. It was great because my retirement went up and all this. So if somebody turns 65 <clears throat> and... They can go on. Well, if they choose to, go ahead. If not, quit. Yeah. Because I know some guys that can go till 80. I know others that should go at 58. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they, yeah. the, the, the health is the entirely different than everybody. And uh, I personally don't, don't see. And also, I got my son coming up. And I would like to see him get a chance to maybe go above 65, 67. And that he could do it if he stays healthy. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now, good. Now, it's very touching to see that, you know, Alex, here he is, kind of at the beginning of his career. Here you were, you know, bringing him along in your career. If you can give Alex, just one bit of advice to last the rest of his life for his aviation career, what would that be? You know, for one thing, just enjoy it. Don't look at it being work. That's it. Um, I don't know how your career is going to go. I'd like to see you move up. What do you got? Four years before you can flow? If it's hiring. Yeah. Yeah. You never know what happens tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And that's the whole thing is this industry is so... Up and down, yeah. yeah. How long did it take yeah. you? When I got hired at Sandpiper, it was a 14-year upgrade time because of the flowback contract that they received after 9-11 with the TWA pilots. By the time I upgraded the first time, I was given a class date. It was four and a half years. They took that away from me after the bankruptcy, and I had to sit a couple more years as an FO before I then upgraded it a second time when I actually made it to class and got my upgrade. And that was a five and a half years, a little, little more than five and a half years. Uh, so I spent half my time at Sandpiper in the left seat. Um, and I got lucky. Uh, there were economic downturns that happened. There were uh, mergers, there were bankruptcies, and I never got furloughed. I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. And as you mentioned earlier, seniority is everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's even a class date. It's yeah. <laughs> Tony Tony's in what's called the what is it, the lost generation? Is that what we're calling it? The lost 10 years or Oh, uh well, it, that actually happened the 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 lost decade. That's what it is. Happened to pilots that were just starting out at places like United Delta and American. And they were FOs and, you know, they've been there a couple of years and their trajectory was to upgrade in a few years. And all of a sudden, boom, 9-11. And now they're either luckily not getting furloughed and then they sit there in the right seat. I just flew with a guy. He goes, yeah, I spent 16 years in the right seat at American. 
Yeah. Oh, I knew guys. They, they were like mostly 17 years. Right yeah. there. And I, I used to rely on them because I'd go, you know, the, the when you came out with the books, I'd say, rather than me digging around and trying to do it, I'd say, would you look that up? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because I'm captain. I can yeah, <laughs> delegate your authority. That's right. That's right. But, Did I steal but, your thunder on that? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is over here scribbling away questions what, what to was, ask. And it was basically that the, the same question of um, that. Um, and then the, the last one that you always ask is the, we stand on the shoulders of the aviators who have gone before us, right? And the basically, like, aviators help aviators, right? And if you could look back at people from when you were coming through, who are people or one person, I know you've been through a storied career, who's someone that helped you, helped guide you, helped mentor you, that, you know, basically what Tony has done with this podcast has done this to, to put out for our future generators, or generation of aviators. There's a couple of them that have been very mentoring and all that is what you're meaning. Yeah. Um, one guy was Dave Johnson. He was a United pilot. He wasn't at the time because he he was one of these that got an aeronautical engineer degree. He did everything by the book. Aeronautical engineering degree. He bought a Piper Cub. He flew around, got 250 hours. And then he went, he got, got uh, hired at United. But then he got furloughed. Yeah. And that's where I met him because he was in L.A. and all that and everything. And uh, he he mentored me a lot. He said, you need to get an engineering degree. You need to do this and do that and everything. And I listened to him. I looked up to him. And, uh, and of course, then there's John Thornburg. Yeah. Oh, God. You like, you like this guy. John Thornburg went to USC, went to USC Law School, was a, um, not a... Um, pilot, but the backseat guy, the Rio, mm -hmm. and because um, he had eyesight problem or something, but and he did that, and then he came up and he was uh, flight instructing where I was. Then one day, John, <laughs> John's a character. Trust me, you just you love him. He's very slow and he talks, and he decided to one day go up and apply for a lawyer at uh, Western Airlines. Huh. So he was in there for the interview, and they were looking at his thing. And this guy had so much time and so much experience. I said, you don't need to be here. You need to be down at the pilot thing. So they took, took him, went down there and said, hey, you have to look at this guy. And they hired him. Nice. And he was at, the, at Western Airlines forever until he retired. Yeah. Western and, became Nor uh, Western became Delta. Delta, which yeah, no. but his eight his but, certificate he had everything. Yeah, he had, uh, just he had, because he wanted to get it. Yeah. He had to have two pages for his license. <laughs> nice, but he was a real good man. He was probably the most brightest person I met. He could read a nine. He could read a hundred page technical manual and remember 98 percent of it. wow yeah wow don't you hate guys like that yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> where i have to read this and then i'll say okay what did i read and you go back yeah but that's not john john could capture that he was so intelligent yeah it was unbelievable wow but he was he was a guy that <laughs> <laughs> the bottles of wine are up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the wine's been broken out. <laughs> well, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for for sharing your story with us. You know, it's been an incredible journey. I know Alex has always uh, just been so proud that you know his dad and grandfather and, and uncle and uncle, and all mm. aviation uh, backgrounds. Um, now, this career. It is more than a job. We always talk about it as it being a career and a passion. And it's just something that until you do it, until you're it's part exactly of it, it you, you have no idea. Until it gets in your blood. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And quite honestly, and I probably shouldn't say this on this, but, you know, I would have done it for a half the price. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because just just being up there is the whole thing. But I deserve more. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. We're, and we, we all feel that way. We, we would do it for less. And sometimes when I hear those words, I do cringe because I think, no, we need, yeah. we, but we, you said it, we deserve more. And I stop and think about that. Passengers, we've, we've grown into this society where we don't really have the respect for this particular aspect of aviation. They, they see us pilots as, well, the airplane pretty much flies itself, doesn't it? it doesn't it land by itself? What, all you're doing is managing the computer system. You're not... And until like, All you do is put, put the autopilot on. That's right. So. You, well, you tried pushing those takeoff, cruise, and land buttons. Those are hard buttons to push. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the truth is, we earn our keep sometimes once a year on that one flight where everything stacks up against you. And we're there and we prevent disaster and nobody knows about it. And I mean, Alex, you've only been at Sandpiper how long now? Seven months? Uh, On the line since, I'll call it August. So yeah, six, seven months. Six, seven months. And I'm sure you've seen a thing or two that it could have gone really bad. Can you imagine after 30 or 40 years of a career, how much you'll see? Well, and that's the thing. It's like, I've already seen like we're on the line of cutting it for that holdover time. You know what I mean? And that's, it wasn't even snowing that bad or like, you know, there's things that you see already, but 30, 40 years, like people don't realize that it's not, we're not paid to push the autopilot button. You know, we're not paid to, to, to manage a computer. Yes, we are. (laughs) We're paid for when shit goes wrong. That's we're right. paid for when you have that rapid decompression because your window blows out and it sucks out a passenger. Southwest, you know what I mean, <laughs> right? Like we're paid for those moments to yeah. safely get that plane back on the ground. Right. That's why we're paid. That's why we deserve it's, more. An anesthesiologist is not paid to knock you out. <laughs> they're paid to wake you up. That's right. And airline pilot is not paid to get you up. They're paid to the get air, you down. They get you down. And nice. Up. It's a. I have one. I have one disagreement with the generation now going. Okay, generally, is they're getting away from needle ball and airspeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the one thing I had, and I had an automated plane, and I mean it was a re- really great automated, and I got to do that HUD and have flight. Big circle over the little circle. That's all I had to do. He never saw my airplane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but what? it's, 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 that's it. But the one thing that I have uh, against all the new stuff yeah. is there's going to be a time when everything goes to shit. Should I say that? Over here? Yeah, yeah, sure. Say that, yeah. And you shut everything off. Mm-hmm. And you fly it by needle, ball, and airspeed. Every major airline accident or crash that has happened in the last decade usually can be brought back to just that. That the pilots got confused over what the aircraft or the computers or the flight directors were telling them. And they ended up unable to control the aircraft in time and crashing. You look at Ethiopia. You look at... I was going to say the, the oh, seven, the, the max, the max issues, that just happened. you know, and, mm-hmm. and even before that, I mean, a lot of those things could have been prevented and the, the final report yeah. just came out on one of those yep. and that aircraft had that particular AOA vein that was damaged. inoperative or damaged from a bird strike that they didn't catch. And it tried to pitch them over and how many crews, five or six crews yeah. caught it, but the last crew didn't and, and that's a disconnect and fly it manually yeah mer- uh, memory items right so i i absolutely agree um the magenta line is more damaging now than ever mm-hmm. and it's so important that's why I, I try to hand fly the airplane as much as i can and occasionally i'll turn the flight directors off and the auto throttles off and and i'll hand fly the airplane with raw data why because when that day comes, as you mentioned, where it all goes to shit and you just have to turn everything off and just fly the airplane, 
I don't want it to be like, oh my God, I haven't done this in a long time. Yeah. I want it to be, well, I just did this last week. Now, big deal. I, I used to, uh, almost all the way to top of climb, I used to hand fly it. And I don't remember where, but most of the time on the approach, it was disconnected. And I would just hand fly on it. Yeah. And uh, that's why, occasionally, once in a while, when you know the weather's uh, down and the, right. the visibility, there's both autopilots and there's the. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But I love that HUD. That HUD is the most beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I enjoyed Tony, the career. Tony doesn't get a HUD. I don't get a HUD. Tony we gets don't a tray table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One or the other. Now, final question before we wrap it up today. What is the one aspect of aviation you miss the most from the golden days? I just enjoyed, I mean, this sounds funny, but I just enjoyed being in the airplane, in the cockpit, and the noise, and the wind, and the everything. It just is uh, something that's lost. I'll never get it back. And my health, of course, will, I will never get a, a special issuance and get all that. So, yeah, I I miss it. I miss it to the degree I don't miss it. Uh, all the crap you guys are going through. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I, I'm happy. I retired when I did. And as I said, we uh, a couple friends and I said. Yeah, we're glad we retired when we did. The thing that he's doing now is I'll send him a my sequence, and he's oh, track, track flight me. aware. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> tracking me on it so that you know it's just a That's hobby. So and cool. I like to do it. Yeah. So. Well, let's just wrap it up by just saying thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <It's been> a- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolute honor. Uh, and we look forward uh, to hearing more about what Alex is going through here. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I'm sure you do too. Yeah. I'm proud of him. So, you know what he did? He did it almost all on his own. I did. I had a little fudge and little money here and there, but he, he helped me out with, uh, obviously my private pilot. Um, and he paid for that. No different than his dad did for him. Um, but my, my mom paid for me. <laughs> but it was six thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> six thousand, not six hundred. I mean, yeah, there's right. the, the, the big discouraging difference there. Yeah. But, uh, but no, the one thing that is, he he made me he made me fly a one fifty two. He made me fly single comm on steam steam gauge and all that stuff. The flight school that I had had a glass airplane, had planes with GPS, but no, he forced me to needle ball and air speed, stick and rudder skills because those skills even though they look innocuous and you're sitting there with your instructor for all the people who are out there listening that you're sitting there with your instructor going, why am I doing this steep turn? Why am I doing these, you know, eights on pylons? What, what's the point of this Shondell or what insert the maneuver that you're doing here? The reason why those are so important is because they give you control of the airplane. They let you know the feel of the airplane. It's not about the, I got to do this maneuver again. It's to get you to be able to handle the airplane so that as you progress, <coughs> those skills do not diminish. Yeah. You fly the airplane. No different than what you guys were just talking about. Yeah. That you hand fly approaches, you know. I'm getting more and more comfortable in the airplane. I'm still not comfortable with the auto throttles taking them off yet, but I'm more and more comfortable coming in when yeah. we're landing or, or taking off. Day that. VFR, landing in... Dallas, Fort Worth, eleven thousand plus foot oh, runway. I'm I, practicing. It, yeah, no, that's a that's. But a, just brief it first. Don't yeah. freak out your captain, okay? <laughs> no, that's a. That's Don't sit a, there just, and go. Dee, dee, dee. Oh, watch this. Hold my beer. <laughs> no, we we actually had one that happened just uh, two days ago when I was coming off my trip. That the um, our there was I guess somebody riding our ass coming in, and the airplane was rolling long on the runway. So they're like, "Hey, we need you to like, don't don't dilly dally, don't roll down the runway like they did. Like, get off." I landed on three five center um, and made made it within like whatever the like the first ninety degree turn was, so like four thousand feet, if that. So that was. I'm sure your passengers loved. Huh. Well, it it was a last minute thing that we were. I wasn't planning on doing that, but we definitely uh, definitely made it. So like it, it is important, right? And I'm I appreciate him for that. Now. <laughs> yeah. Now you get it. Yeah. Now I get it. You know. But. Yeah. I, 
And it's been it's been awesome growing up with him and now being on this side of it. Yeah. So look how old I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My yeah. priest, I enjoyed this. Yeah. Good. This was fun. And that wraps up episode 125 of the Squawk Head End podcast. A very special thank you to Captain Greg Daigle for sharing his journey in aviation with us. I also want to say thank you to Alex for joining us today and for the idea to interview his dad. What a special connection they have. And a family of aviation is something very special to hold on to. We hope that you enjoyed listening on our flight today. If you did, please pay it forward by sharing this podcast with your friends and family and online. Make sure to subscribe or follow the Squawk Ident podcast on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. We also love receiving listener feedback. You can send us an email or even audio feedback via our website at aviatortony.com. That's Alpha Victor, the number eight, Romeo Tango, Oscar November Yankee.com. Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram users can also find us under the Squawk Out In podcast. One final thank you to all of you for taking the time to listen to these grateful aviators. Keep the dirty side down out there, be safe, and take care of each other. Good night, everyone. <laughs>